Hello and welcome back to my channel What If Deku Tuo. Join us as we delve into the realms of fanfiction and fantasy, bringing you the best stories and discussions. Today, we're kicking off part one of our series. If you enjoy this video, please give it a like and subscribe for more content in the future. The author of this story is Drip Bayless from Fanfiction.net. All the relevant links are in the description. Feel free to say hello to the author on their profile. Now, let's dive into the fanfic. Inko Midoriya was a great mother. She would never claim to be a great person, and she would certainly never claim to be a hero, but she always strove to be the strongest pillar of love, care, and support that her darling little Izuku could ever need. So, it naturally made the predicament she was currently in that much more tenuous. Izuku had been diagnosed as quirkless earlier that day. She had her suspicions about the diagnosis primarily because her estranged brother had been a late bloomer, and the idea of judging potential quirk status on the presence of a toe joint which in and of itself already had insidious implications regarding genetic superiority was always ridiculous to her. Regardless, however, her son was crushed, and the ride home was nothing short of melancholic. Izuku sequestered himself in his room, and Inko gave him the space he non-verbally requested. After a little while, she made her way to his room to check on him, and her heart constricted at the sight. Izuku was watching his favorite video of his idol, All Might, rescuing dozens of civilians from a burning building with a triumphant smile. It was a kind of smile that she was experienced enough to know was fake, but her son didn't know that. All he saw was the immutable confidence of an unstoppable and unwavering paragon. Inko supposed that was the point, but it only served to embolden the jaded feelings she had towards the glitz and glam of the hero industry, hiding the horrible underbelly that lay underneath. No, she wasn't going to travel down that tired rabbit hole again. Her son needed her, and she would be there for him. Hearing her come in, he looked back at her with tears threatening to pour from his eyes. In a tone that was much too broken for any child, he asked, Can I be a hero, too? While pointing to All Might in the video. And that was the core problem, wasn't it? How was she going to tell her son that she couldn't support him? How was she going to explain to her son that she didn't believe that he could? Not because he was quirkless, but because she didn't believe in heroics anymore. How could she properly articulate that she wanted to keep her son as far away from heroics as she could because she had already seen the worst of what that part of society had to offer, and she wanted, no, needed to spare her child from it all? How was she going to keep her dear Izuku from becoming as jaded as she was? He could probably see the consternation on her face, because his own face sunk and the tears began to fall. Refusing to see her son fall into such despair, she made her decision. It was a decision she would either come to regret later on or potentially look back on fondly, but she would leave that to future Inko. She quickly made her way to her son and wrapped him in the warmest embrace she could manage, running her hand through the soft, wild curls that she loved so much while whispering quiet assurances to him. It was now or never. Izuku, look at me, she softly began, wiping away the tears from his face with her thumb when he complied. You are a kind, courageous, and brilliant boy with a heart for helping anyone and everyone in need. I truly believe that you could become a fantastic hero. Izuku froze when he heard that, and he could only stare at his mother with wide and hopeful eyes. Inko could also see suspicion in those eyes. His gaze was searching taking in every detail on her face while his brain was hard at work running over each of her words along with the tone she said them in. She could tell that he really wanted to believe her, that he really wanted to grab onto the hope burning inside of him and take it as far as it would go. However, she could also tell that something was stopping him. There's a but to this, isn't there? And there it was. She loved and hated how smart her son was at the age of five. He was, frankly, unnaturally smart, a trait he likely got from his grandfather on his father's side. Apparently, Hisashi's father had a ridiculous intelligence quirk that was practically a complete brain mutation, and he passed part of that mutation on to Hisashi alongside Weak, 
mildly uncontrollable fire breathing from Hisashi's mother's dragon quirk. It was a little unprecedented for quirks to interact like that in offspring, and it added to her suspicions about Izuku's quirkless status because Hisashi clearly imparted a lot of that intelligence onto his son. She wished her side of the family was that cool. She could vaguely remember her biological mother being able to float before she had to give her and her brother up for adoption, and she had no idea how attraction of small objects resulted from floating and minor telekinesis. Quirk science was weird, so there was no telling exactly what quirk factors could have come together in Izuku if any and how they'd even express themselves if they had. She'd have to research more on the subject. She felt Izuku's hand softly caressing her cheek, bringing her out of her internal ramblings. She sheepishly grimaced, knowing she had gone off on another one of her mental tangents. Her son, having mumble storms of his own for as long as he could talk they were no doubt genetic, only softly smiled with more patience than any five-year-old should have. Smiling back, she picked him up and carried him out of his room and to her own bedroom. Izuku, while clearly confused, said nothing as Inko sat him down on her bed and walked towards her closet. She reached for the door and hesitated, having seconds thoughts about going through with her plan. She couldn't have any second thoughts. She was doing this, and she was going to see it through. Pushing forward, she slid open her closet door and moved the hanging clothes to the side before reaching for the wall behind them and pushing on a secret panel. Part of the wall caved in and revealed another compartment within, and she stepped to the side to show Izuku an old hero costume hanging in the space where the wall previously stood. It was a simple black spandex suit with a green V on the torso, accompanied with boots, gloves, and a mask in the same shade of green. She turned to her starstruck son who was looking at the costume and with a mix of incredulity and wonder. She smiled sadly as his eyes finally fixed on her. You're a pro hero, but I've never seen you go on patrol. Are you an underground hero? How do you fight criminals? You have such a fantastic quirk, so I suppose it does make sense. Even if you couldn't move people with your quirk, you could easily attract and manipulate small, heavy objects around to direct them in combat or rescue operations. Izu, breathe, she instructed with a more genuine smile. When he stopped his mutter spree, she sat down on the bed next to him and readied herself for the conversation that she never wanted to have. To answer your questions, yes, I was a pro hero. I was underground, so I wasn't too popular with the general public, but I made a decent name for myself in underground circles. You're on the right track about how I used my quirk for both combat and rescue operations, but I mostly used my quirk to supplement my hand-to-hand -hand combat. I'm showing and telling you all of this to answer your but question from earlier. I truly do believe that you can become a hero. But, but I don't think you can become a hero like All Might. She could see the pain and hurt in his eyes before they gave way to a pleading ferocity. But All Might is the greatest hero. That's then mostly true, she began, and that's part of the problem. All Might is like a god amongst men. He sets an impeccable standard for heroes everywhere, one that most people may not be able to attain because they're just not as absurdly powerful as him. Are you following so far? At his nod, she continued, All Might can do things that most heroes could only dream of doing, and that's with quirks of their own. For now, you don't have one of your own, and that will make your journey to becoming a hero significantly harder. You will have to work at least twice as hard as everyone else just to catch up with them, and even then, you may only receive less than half of the credit when the job is done. Inko wasn't going to pretend that Izuku wouldn't face any discrimination for being quirkless. It was something that he was better off knowing right away than finding out later in a less favorable manner. She paused to ensure that he was still paying attention. When she confirmed that he was, she pressed on. It will not be an easy task, Izuku. You will have to dedicate a sizable portion of your time and energy to training and preparing for this, both physically and mentally. There's also no real guarantee that it will work out, and that's even with a quirk. She sighed. There's the elephant in the room that you currently don't have a quirk, 
And while that may seem like a death sentence, it isn't in the grand scheme. Not everyone has a combat-applicable quirk. So those heroes that don't must work around that limitation to keep up with other heroes that do as well as villains with powerful and dangerous quirks. You'll need to know how to defend yourself, how to combat any potential enemy, how to prepare for any and every situation, and when to take a step back and call for help. Seeing that he was hanging off her every word, she gave him a warm, challenging smile. Luckily for you, you happen to have a retired pro living in your home that will happily train her son into the ground until he's the best damn hero this city has ever produced. You said a swear, Izuku said with a smile forming onto his face that was positively infectious. She knew she made the right decision as she watched Izuku's hope return and the light in his eyes brighten in real time. Are you ready for the sheer amount of hard work that you will have to put in to become a hero without a quirk? She asked her son with a deadly serious tone before kneeling down to directly meet his gaze. It's okay to say no, honey. No matter what you do, no matter what you decide on, no matter what path you take, I will always love you and be in your corner to the very end. You have my unconditional support, always. Izuku teared up again at the declaration but they weren't pain tears like they were before. Inko could see a steely determination form from the hope in those watery eyes of his, and she had all the answers she needed. She knew that she would soon have to test his resolve, but for now, she knew she made the right decision. I'm gonna be the best damn hero this city has ever seen, her son declared. You're goddamn right you are, she answered with equal fervor before pinching his nose shut. And no swearing. The two fell into laughter, and Izuku leaped into his mother's arms to give her the tightest hug he could. Thank you, mom, he muttered. Of course, my little Izu, she responded. She felt him go still in her embrace for a moment before pulling away to gaze curiously at her. You said a few times that I don't currently have a quirk, as if that might change. What did you mean by that? Inko could see the gears working in his brain even before she could give him an answer. He was probably already onto a few lines of thought and just wanted a potential nudge in the right direction. Well, it's possible that you're a late bloomer or that you have a quirk that's more latent in nature than other quirks. I'm sure you've noticed that you're considerably smarter than everyone around you at your preschool and he had definitely noticed if the way his eyes suspiciously could not meet hers in embarrassment was any indication. The other kids just call me weird. I notice that I sometimes make the adults uncomfortable when I'm around them. I just figured I was ahead because you used to let me sit on your lap while doing work on the computer. Children should not be able to use and navigate the internet as well as you do, is a coup. Nor should they be able to proofread and spellcheck official documents, she said with an amused smile. Izuku's reddening cheeks were icing on the cake. However, she could feel the heat coming off of his face at his blush as if it were a fever. As quickly as she noticed it, though, it went away. She filed it away for later. There was also the fact that she'd sometimes notice faint, white wisps coming from Izuku's hair when he was really concentrated on something but that could have just been her imagination. She'd keep a close eye on it nonetheless. Anyway, she continued, I'll have to do a bit more research on quirk science and investigate some things in our family before I can give you a definitive answer. For now, I'll handle your training without any quirks in mind. Okay, mom, he replied before his eyes lit up again. Why did you retire, anyway? She should have expected that question. She tried to brush over the fact that she no longer did hero work and put the idea of her training him into his head as quickly as possible so that he'd focus on the training and not the other details, but she should have known better. Her son wouldn't just miss details like that, unfortunately. She'd be sure to immerse him in the world of informatics and investigation as part of his training. Another time, sweetie, she said with a grimace. How about I make you some katsudan to celebrate your training? Izuku's eyes narrowed at her, but he reluctantly accepted the bribe to drop the subject, at least for now. She knew she wouldn't get off that easily, though. She'd have to come clean about everything later on. 
but she would hold out for as long as she could until he was old enough to handle it. For now, she'd sharpen him into a blade ready to deal with the most dangerous parts of heroics, both both villain and hero alike. Izuku felt nothing but pain. In fact, pain was the thing he had become most familiar with over the years. For the last half decade, Izuku's mother had, in no uncertain terms, beaten the dog shit out of him five days out of the week. He had undergone ruthless physical training in combat, stealth, cardio, weight training, a bit of gymnastics, and even Parker for when it would inevitably become necessary. And Izuku loved every minute of it. At age five, Izuku was started off with something relatively light, dodge training. Inko called in a favor that an old associate from her time as a pro owed her, and she managed to secure a small training room in the city as well as a frightening amount of small, rubber balls. Izuku's objective was simple, dodge the oncoming projectiles that his mother would launch at him with an unsettling grin. It seemed simple enough until he realized that his mother had impeccable aim and the arm of a major league pitcher. What she did not tell him was that she'd be yoinking the balls behind him back into her grasp with her quirk, and he'd have to dodge those, too. It doubled as training in situational awareness. Strangely, Izuku would occasionally feel an unnatural heat in his body, usually congregating in his chest. When that heat made its appearance, Izuku felt as if the world had slowed down a bit, and the balls were suddenly easier to dodge. Those strange bursts didn't last for very long, usually for a few seconds at most, and he tended to feel even more worn out in the aftermath. He chalked it up to bursts of adrenaline until he had further information. He didn't notice the sparks and flickers of yellow that appeared in his hair when the phenomena happened, but his mother had, and she made note of them every time they did with a vindicated grin. She wouldn't tell him what she was smiling about, though, at age 10, Izuku learned firsthand what it truly meant to be quirkless, regardless of his suspicions of the accuracy of his status. This lesson came in the form of two distinct incidents happening on the same day, one being more pleasant than the other. The first incident began with a regular day at school for Izuku. That was, if regular involved him jumping in front of his sort of friend, Katsuki Bakugo before the explosive blonde could continue tormenting another boy cowering on the ground. Izuku would have liked to believe that it wasn't a regular occurrence, but... The hell are you doing, Deku? The ash blonde growled at him with eyes filled with more annoyance than anger. You can't just beat people down like this, Kaken, Izuku responded with a tinge of exasperation. You've made your point already, whatever point that even was to begin with. That, in Izuku's estimation, may not have been the right thing to say. Oh, really? Bakugo growled in a low, dangerous tone. You think you're better than me, huh? What the hell can you even do about it? You quirkless Deku. Izuku didn't particularly want this to end in violence, but he knew that it was becoming unavoidable. A quick glance around showed that they were beginning to attract a crowd of other students, and he saw a teacher wander over to see what the ruckus was about. By then, the kid who was previously cowering had long since made his escape while Bakugo and company were distracted, so all the teacher saw was Bakugo and two others surrounding the unsettling kid who didn't have a quirk. So, he did what any other reasonable adult would do in that situation. He turned around and walked away. That's… that's gotta be illegal, right? Izuku thought with a deadpan frown. He didn't dwell on it. However, as he had a more pressing issue to deal with in the form of a pissed-off Bakugo and his two lackeys making their way toward him, he really did not want to fight them, but it seemed inevitable. He just hoped his mother wouldn't be too upset with him. If I have to stop you myself, that's exactly what I'll do, he said with a measure of conviction that took Bakugo slightly aback. It's what a hero would do and that, Izuku learned, was definitely not the right thing to say. You looking down on me, you shitty, worthless nerd, Bakugo almost screamed. Guess I'll have to finally put you in your place and remind you of the goddamn pebble you are. And without any further preamble, Bakugo threw a right hook at Izuku, his fist crackling with small explosions from his quirk. Resigning himself to his fate, 
Izuku quickly sidestepped the punch and snapped a firm hold onto the blonde's arm, flipping him over his hip and slamming Bakugo to the ground with a thud. Bakugo was frozen. Deku, the weak, defenseless nerd, had actually reversed his attack. Deku could actually defend himself. It was a shock to his system and caused him to freeze and only stare up at the boy above him, and he did not like what he saw. Meanwhile, Izuku has felt the world slow down once again. The familiar heat was making itself known in his chest, but it also felt like twinges of it were spreading throughout his body. That was certainly new. He'd think about that later, though. In his periphery, he saw several grotesquely long fingers lunge for him at a crawling pace. Sidestepping once more, he seized the boy's long fingers and employed one of the tactics his mother had drilled into him. Ruthlessly attack joints if your opponent was dumb enough to leave them exposed. And with a pop that made everyone in the area wince, that was exactly what he did. He still could not rest, though, as his final opponent was trying to lunge at him from his other side. The portly boy with minimally effective wings tried to use the barest of glides his quirk allowed to get the drop on Izuku. The heat in his chest left him, but the heat in the rest of his body remained. Turning around to face the winged boy head-on, he swung his arm out to clothesline the boy and kill any momentum he had. That was the intention, anyway. What actually happened was that the boy slammed into Izuku's arm as if it was a wall, and Izuku inadvertently launched the larger boy into the crowd with the follow-through of his swing. Yes, that was certainly a new development. While Izuku was stuck contemplating what exactly happened amidst the deathly silent and awestruck crowd, Bakugo was focused on what he had seen. Particularly, he was stuck on the small flames that protruded from Izuku's hair for mere moments at a time, one yellow and one green. Deku's got a quirk, and he's been lying about it. While Bakugo silently seethed at the perceived injustice, the teacher from earlier had finally returned to handle the ruckus. However, he was met with a silent collection of children, all staring in tangible wonder and fear at Izuku. Midoriya, what have you done to these boys? The teacher immediately accused with a stern glare at the young green head. A part of Izuku wanted to flinch and cower at the glare he was receiving, but a larger part found the man horribly lacking in intimidation factor compared to frightening taskmaster that was his mother. However, the older man did not even give Izuku a chance to speak before he quickly disregarded him entirely. I don't want to hear any of your lies, he said before turning to a bystander. What did Midoriya do to those boys? Said bystander, a brunette with a heavy chameleon mutation, looked as if he was about to speak before one of his eyes fell on Izuku. The chameleon boy subconsciously flinched at the gaze, regardless of how non-threatening it actually was. Um, nothing, he quickly answered. He did nothing. The teacher raised an eyebrow, not terribly convinced. Oh, really? he asked, now turning his gaze to the crowd at large. Did Midoriya truly do nothing? The choruses of, yep, yeah, aha, uh -huh, and I'm not a rat surprised the teacher. It was very unusual for anyone to go to bat for the little, quirkless weirdo much less an entire crowd of bystanders who had clearly just watched a fight. Realizing he couldn't reprimand him without any proof, he scanned the area to find even the smallest thing to pin on the boy. His eyes landed on one of the students on the ground, clutching his fingers as if they had been broken. A cruel smirk finally finding its way onto his face, he walked over to the boy and kneeled down beside him. Did Midiria do this to you? he asked as gently as he could manage. The boy briefly looked up at the man through the pain before his gaze flickered to the aforementioned boy, and he immediately clammed up. I, I fell, he quickly stuttered out before shutting his mouth again. The man was now positively beside himself. He could not fathom what the hell the boy had done to command such fear. Was it fear coming from the other children? It certainly wasn't respect or anything positive in nature. The man made a mental note that Midoriya needed to be watched by the faculty and potentially some other parties. Before he could travel any further down that thread, the boy of the hour hesitantly stepped forward. 
Izuku weathered the weary and fearful looks of the other children as well as the heated glares from the teacher and Bakugo before stopping in front of the kid whose fingers he, as his mother would say, forcefully readjusted. Izuku didn't know what exactly compelled him to step forward, but he could feel an even newer sensation of warmth, this time in his palms. This time, he couldn't ignore the faint pink glow they sported while everyone took notice of the small flickers of pink flames that sprouted from Izuku's hair. Bakugo was again reduced to a snarling rage as Izuku kneeled down and took the injured boy's fingers into his hands, allowing the warm, pink glow to bathe over the kid's fingers. Within seconds, the previously broken fingers reset themselves and straightened back up, looking no worse for wear. The crowd of onlookers had assumed that they could not have been any more surprised by the day's events, but the blatant display of a quirk from the quirkless kid after he had handily defeated the class tough guy and his cronies was a little much for those in attendance. Many had decided to just walk away from the scene to process everything somewhere else, while many others, such as the chameleon boy, made mental notes not to mess with Midoriya, lest they get their fingers broken, as well. Bakugo's two cronies scampered away to lick their wounds and think about their life choices. Bakugo, on the other hand, had festered into vicious glowering, trying to will the green head to melt with his glare. It wasn't yielding any success, which only served to strengthen the blonde's glare. The teacher, meanwhile, had a notable glimmer in his eye as if he had come to a profound realization. Midoriya, detention after school for quirk usage during school hours, is all he said before walking away from the scene. Izuku, stuck in the reverie of his mom, apparently being correct about him being a late bloomer, was ripped out of said reverie when he processed the teacher's statement. Are you foo? Izuku could only sigh in a mixture of frustration and resignation as he walked home from school after his detention. He was looking forward to giving his mother the news, although he was curious as to how it would affect his training. His mother had specifically not accounted for quirk usage in any of the combat and movement training they had done, so he supposed that she would figure out ways to incorporate his quirk in the routines and stances in a way similar to her own fighting style. Of course, that would have to come after they figured out exactly what his quirk even was. He was certain that the warmth he periodically felt during training had something to do with it rather than just being adrenaline, and he at least knew that he could heal people's injuries with whatever caused the warm sensations in his palms. Maybe his quirk was similar to Kakin's in that way. Speaking of which, Deku. He had sensed a presence waiting around the school when he left, and the presence followed him on his path home. If it weren't for the shock of Ash Blonde in his periphery whenever he glanced over, he would have been worried and taken a different route. Stopping and turning to face his sort of friend who had been following him, he took stock of the absolutely livid snarl his face contorted into. This is probably about my quirk, he thought with a sigh. Hi, Kak. Where do you get off looking down on me, huh? Bakugo interrupted Izuku with violently crackling palms. He grabbed the scruff of Izuku's gakuren and pulled the boy into an adjacent alleyway before roughly tossing him into it. Looking down on you, Izuku ventured in confusion as he stood and dusted himself off. He hadn't been looking down on Bakugo at all. Sure, he thought the boy was an asshole more times than should be necessary, but he didn't think any less of him, especially not in comparison to himself. Up until that afternoon, Bakugo had a quirk and Izuku didn't, and that automatically made him superior to Izuku in the eyes of society. Izuku was well aware of that. You've been hiding your shitty-ass quirk all this time to laugh at me behind my back, haven't you, you shitty Deku? Bakugo interrupted Izuku's internal musings with more screaming. Izuku was perplexed. That was more vitriol than Bakugo had ever spewed to anyone. Where did it even come from? You think you're so cool that you have some shitty quirk to heal the extras? You're a pebble in my path to greatness, a worthless scrub that needs to remember his god in place. You hear me, Deku? Izuku had begun to suspect that the teacher had gotten to Bakugo some time before they left. The things he was saying were absurd, and Izuku knew that nothing productive would come from the conversation should it continue. 
Sure, Kaken, I'll stay out of your way, Izuku dully said before brushing past Bakugo and continuing on his way home. He didn't mean to come off as dismissive, but he wanted to placate the angry blonde, and he wouldn't dare grovel or cower to his attempts at intimidation to do that. Unfortunately, Bakugo took that as another slight against him from the boy he believed was acting above his station to personally insult him, and his temper that was already hanging by a thread had been lost. He roughly grabbed Izuku and launched him deeper into the alley before igniting his palm and blowing the boy back even further. Bakugo was seeing red, and he would be sure to remind Deku of his place in way that he'd never forget. Izuku, on the other hand, was not in the mood for this shit. Bakugo had already tried to attack him earlier that day, and that became a whole thing that landed him in detention with a teacher who clearly hated him and probably put Bakugo up to this very encounter. He watched Bakugo approach with a vicious gleam in his eyes that promised nothing but pain, and he could already feel his body rapidly heating up again. However, it was much greater than normal as he could see thin wisps of smoke steaming from his skin. When Bakugo took a step within a yard's distance of Izuku, something within him snapped, and the familiar warmth became a shocking yet comfortable haze of heat that washed over the entire alley. What followed was an explosion of vibrant colors, turning the dank alley into a mosaic of flames kissing every end of the rainbow. Bakugo was momentarily pulled out of his rage by the sight of his classmates standing in front of him wreathed in flames of every color. His normally green hair was spattered with the colored tips of flames moving to the beat of their own drums. His breath hitched at the way Izuku's eyes glowed a threatening shade of green. Bakugo, for the second time that day, had frozen. He could do nothing but watch in alarm as Izuku slowly raised his right hand and pointed his palm at him. The way Izuku's violently emerald eyes narrowed with contempt at him made his stomach drop, and he truly did not know if he would make it out of that alley in one piece. In an instant, a bright flash erupted from Izuku's palm, and Bakugo clamped his eyes shut in a vice grip, awaiting the inevitable burns to wash over him. But they never did. He waited at least five seconds for something to happen only opening his eyes to assess the situation when it was clear that nothing would be happening. Izuku was gone, the only evidence that he was even there being the glossy rainbow burned into the concrete where he once stood. Bakugo took a moment to catch his breath before quickly leaving the alley and making a beeline for his home, pushing past the nosy extras who came to investigate the explosions. Izuku sat on the fire escape of one of the buildings looking down at the alley. He would have given himself a rightful pat on the back for using a fake blast as a diversion to make his escape up the walls and out of the sight his mother would be so proud, but he was still reeling from the, he supposed, true activation of his quirk. He stared down at his right hand, eyes fixed on the beautiful fire that encased it. It was like nothing he'd ever seen before. Endeavor's powerful, sun-like flames were one thing, but the malleable stained glass portrait in his hand was breathtaking. The warmth and inexplicable bouts of speed and strength now also made a great deal more sense. Putting the flames out, he hurried up to the roof of the building and down the fire escape on the other side to book it home and show his mother. She was right all along about his quirk, and now, a whole new dimension had been added to both his arsenal and the kind of training they could do together. Finally arriving at his complex, he bounded up the stairs and giddily reached for his front door, practically throwing himself inside in his excitement. Mom, you were right, I have a... He paused at the sight of two policemen and a man in a beige trench coat in his living room. His mother was sitting on their couch and looked more exhausted than Izuku had ever seen her. Izuku, welcome home, honey, his mother said with a smile that didn't quite reach her eyes. What's going on? he questioned, carefully examining the police in his home. Said policeman and the man in the trench coat looked to Inko, and she nodded. Taking that as his cue, the man in the trench coat looked back toward Izuku. Hello Midoriya, I'm Detective Tsukachi. We were only here to verify the events of what transpired here earlier today. It's a blessing that you weren't home for it. 
Inko cut back in before Izuku's worry could start to overtake him. Your father came home. That was, good, bad, Izuku wasn't entirely sure given the context of their current situation. He hadn't seen his father since shortly before his diagnosis. As far as he knew, his father worked overseas and sent money back every month. Is he okay? Did he do something? Izuku hazarded. Inko let lose a mirthless chuckle. Oh, he did something. All right, he came back with the intention to kill you for being quirkless. The room was engulfed in a silence that was equal parts heavy and awkward. No one said a word as Izuku was left to process that fun little nugget. He opened his mouth to speak, but he closed it, not finding the right words. He repeated the process for several minutes until he uttered the only thing that came to mind. Would you believe I just awakened my quirk? The tension in the room shattered like glass as his mother couldn't help the small smile and chuckle that escaped her. The two officers and detective in the room appeared to relax as well, although there was an air of curiosity around them regarding the boy that was apparently a late bloomer at the most hilariously convenient of times. I thought that was already a foregone conclusion, Izuku, Inko asked with a smirk. What do you mean? You're ten years old with the brain of a college student, she replied, maintaining her amusement. Even if those sparks in your hair turned out to be nothing significant, I think we can safely say that your brain power certainly isn't natural. Wait, the sparks in my hair? I just found out about those today. You knew about them? Inko raised an eyebrow at her son. You didn't? Izuku was sliding further into incredulity the longer the conversation went on. His mother knew about the sparks in his hair that he could now surmise were connected to the warmth he felt on occasion. His mother was straight up telling him that she knew about them and hadn't mentioned it. Sure, both she and he were highly suspicious about his quirk status given the evidence at their disposal, but she proceeded with his training as if he didn't have one. Being dubious is one thing but she had verifiable proof of the contrary. Why hadn't she said anything? I didn't want you to become complacent, she spoke up. Izuku was taken aback at first until it dawned on him that he likely muttered that whole thing aloud without realizing. Again, shaking off his embarrassment and ignoring the amused smiles of the police and detective, he fixed his mother with a frown. You thought I would become complacent if I knew I had a quirk. Inko's face softened. Izuku, the basis of your training was to prepare you for the arduous task of becoming a pro-hero without the use of a quirk. If the extent of your quirk was enhanced intelligence and sparky hair, that objective wouldn't have changed, but your motivation to improve despite lacking a quirk may have been truncated, even if only subconsciously. Her smirk returned. Besides, I've been teaching you to use your brain in a fight. And going by how scuffed your Gakuren looks, it seems to be coming in handy. Okay, Izuku could concede that point. He didn't have to like it, but he did understand. If I may interrupt, Detective Chukachi spoke up, not wanting to ruin the, frankly, entertaining discussion between mother and son, but still needing to conclude his business there. Had your husband, er, ex-husband now, ever expressed any overtly or suspiciously quirkist sympathies before today. Ex-husband? What do you mean by ex? Izuku hesitantly queried. If his father truly returned with the express intentions of killing him, he'd understand why his mother would preemptively declare him as her ex-husband before even filing for. Oh, honey, Hisashi doesn't exist anymore, Inko softly answered. Okay, what? He quickly composed himself and locked eyes with his mother. You mean he's dead? Izuku couldn't decide on feeling relief or grief at the revelation. A little more than dead, one of the police officers mumbled just loudly enough for everyone to hear. His partner elbowed him in the ribs and shot him a glare, to which he shot a deadpan stare in return. Am I wrong? What would you call someone literally being torn apart by their atoms and then dispersed into the open air? Yeah, but you could at least be tactful about it, the second officer hissed back. The kid just lost his father. A father who was trying to kill him, the officer maintained his deadpan. 
The sound of the detective clearing his throat and the venomous glare he was shooting them ended the bickering before it could continue any further. Meanwhile, Izuku had effectively blue-screened at the details of his fa at Hisashi's death. His bewildered eyes met the green of his mother's in a silent conversation between the two. She solemnly nodded to confirm that he did indeed hear them correctly. You, you atomized him? He finally managed to get out. He was threatening you. Izuku waited for any further explanation, but one never came. Um, right. He knew she was ruthless, especially during training, and he knew of her past as an underground pro hero. But that newest bit of information only confirmed one thing to him. His mother was terrifying. He was thankfully saved by the detective rising from his seat and speaking up again. I think we can conclude things here. For now, we've gotten all the information we need, and you no doubt want to spend some time with your son. Thank you for your time, Mrs. Midoriya. We'll contact you again if we need to go over anything else. With a bow, the detective left with the two policemen in tow, leaving the Midoriya duo to themselves in their living room. Izuku sighed and melted into the couch next to his mother, and he leaned into her touch when she softly ran her hand through his hair. How are you feeling, son? she asked with a hint of trepidation. Izuku exhaled, feeling as though he was releasing all of the events of the day. In a word, exhausted. That's certainly understandable, she said with a soft smile. Why don't you tell me about your quirk? It was as if a switch was flipped within the boy as his eyes lit up with excitement. He practically launched off of the couch and started moving the, the coffee table and any other wooden piece of furniture a healthy distance away from him. Standing in the middle of the room, he reached for the familiar warmth inside of him, and he ignited in a pillar of multicolored flames. Inko was mesmerized at the sight. She hadn't anticipated his quirk to be so. Beautiful, she mumbled aloud without taking her eyes off of him. Izuku preened at the praise, and his flames began to take on a crimson hue across the board. That was surprising enough to the duo, but the resulting increase in temperature alarmed them. Izuku panicked when he saw the footprints he was burning into the carpet, and he quickly cut off his quirk. He had no idea what had happened. When he first awakened the quirk, the flames were brilliant and powerful, but he was also actively projecting them to keep Bakugo at bay. They weren't burning nearly as brightly just then, but they transitioned to a solid red when his mother complimented them, and they felt even hotter than they were earlier that day without even increasing in size. Were the flames tied to his emotions? It seemed like too much of a hair trigger to be the case. And why transition to purely red when he was feeling happy? Could he access other colors individually? Would it make a difference? The red flames were demonstrably hotter than the multicolored fire. Would that be the case with the others? He was snapped out of his thoughts by his mother struggling to suppress her giggle fit. It immediately dawned on him what happened. I said all of that out loud, didn't I? He asked with a sheepish scratch to the back of his head. MHM. You really are my son, she said with a warm smile, noting the white embers wafting from his hair. The smile then tightened into a thin line. There was one thing you said, though, about projecting your flames to keep back Hugo at bay. What did you mean by that, exactly? Izuku, now knowing his mother could literally atomize a human and sensing potential danger, told her about everything that happened that day. He told her about the initial scuffle with Bakugo, he told her about his teacher's blatant bigotry, he told her about Bakugo hunting him down and his suspicions that the teacher orchestrated it, and he told her about his quirk's activation. The blankness of her face after he finished deeply unsettled him. He could see a ravenous fury in her gaze that contrasted with the careful nothingness, and it had him sweating bullets. It may not have been a very heroic thought but he was just glad to not be the target of her wrath and prayed for a quick demise to anyone that was. Across town, the teacher in question was reading a copy of Meta Liberation War in his study when a chill ran up his spine. For the briefest of moments, he felt as if the eyes of the Grim Reaper itself were bearing down on him. Probably Midoriya's fault. The principal is already on the ship, 
but the sooner I can get the rest of the faculty on board with Destro's ideals, the better. Back in the apartment, Izuku was nervous about what his mother would do to anyone who had even accidentally wronged him in his life. Um, mom? Why you're not going to tear Bakugo apart and then reassemble him into a pig or something, right? He truly hoped he did not doom his sort of friend, was that still even applicable? To a horrible fate. H.M., Inko was broken out of whatever unholy machinations she was conjuring in her mind. Oh, no, I'm certain that Katsuki learned his lesson and won't be bothering you for a while. Besides, I can't reassemble someone after taking them apart. There's no going back for them. Anyway, I'll be sure to have a talk with Mitsuki about him soon. Her eyes darkened and the bloodthirsty grin she usually reserved for training made its way back onto her face. I'm more concerned with your teacher who thought it acceptable to put my baby in harm's way. And then, in a flash, her grin disappeared and the bloodlust vanished alongside it, and she was back to sporting the loving smile he was familiar with. You mentioned being able to heal someone's fingers after they were forcefully readjusted. The color was pink, right? At his nod, she hummed and stroked her chin, going by the yellow embers you sported when dodging and the white embers that appear when you're thinking hard over something. It's likely that your flames each have individual properties to them, and they come together to create an inferno that functions similarly to endeavors. The way she spoke Endeavor's name with such utter disdain surprised Izuku. He didn't know that they knew each other. It was also possible that she just knew of him and disliked him for one reason or another. He wouldn't really blame her if that was the case. Questions for later, though. For now, freshen up and get ready for dinner. I'll make you some more celebratory katsudan for awakening your quirk, Inko declared and darted into the kitchen. Izuku sighed. He was more than familiar with the Katsudan bribe. Guess Endeavor is a sore subject for her. The next morning, Izuku rolled out of bed to prepare for the usual light spar and informatics training that happened on Saturdays. However, a knock at their door surprised them, as Inko wasn't expecting anyone that day. Opening the door, a short, white-furred animal in a suit stood on two legs in front of her with a smile. Mezu? Inko asked in shock. Mrs. Midoriya, how lovely it is to see you again, Nezu chirps. Or, shall you return to being Miss Akatani, given that the remains of your husband have likely entered the lower atmosphere? Inko's eyes widened before narrowing at the animal of indeterminable origin. How did you find out about that already? It literally happened yesterday. She paused, and then she slumped in resignation. You know what? Of course, you found out about it. You're Nezu. That I am, the creature agreed with grin that just bordered on predatory. I'd ask you why you're here, Inko began before stepping aside and motioning for him to enter. But the fact that you tracked me down and came in person means that you have a good reason, and I probably won't like it. Nezu's smile faltered as they entered the living room. You're correct, unfortunately. I wish we could have met again under better circumstances, but alas, it is not to be. Inko sighed and nodded, turning her head to her son who was attempting to be inconspicuous and eavesdrop on them without being seen. Izuku, come meet an old acquaintance of mine. Izuku blanched at being detected, and he dejectedly meandered into the living room while his mother mirthfully shook her head. Izuku, this is Nezu. We worked a few cases together when I was still active. Inko explained to the boy who had already set his analytical gaze onto the furry creature, who in turn had given Izuku one of his own. Why, hello, young Midoriya, am I a mouse? Am I a dog? Am I a bear? You're a chimera, although the specifics of what animals compose your DNA is a bit tricky. Your snout is too pointed to be that of a dog or a bear, but your paws and tail aren't reminiscent of mice, at least none that I'm familiar with. Even so, your general appearance does suggest rodent of some kind, but that could also just as easily be a marsupial's appearance. That would explain why your tail has fur and isn't bushy, but it still wouldn't explain the nature of your paws. Izuku only paused to accept the cup of tea handed to him by his mother, 
who had taken the opportunity afforded to her by Izuku's mumble storm to make tea. Then again, I suppose you wouldn't be much of a chimera if the lion's share of your DNA came from a singular animal. Hum, not necessarily true, but you are certainly on the right track oh dear, your hair has combusted, Nezu commented before taking a sip of his tea. Oh my, you remembered my favorite blend after a decade, how lovely. You've saved my life directly or otherwise on several occasions, Inko softly responded. You're also one of the few people in heroics that I trust implicitly. It's the least I could do. Izuku had abandoned his muttering about Nezu's species when he pointed out that his hair was on fire. He reached up to investigate, and he found pure white flames in his hands that quickly died out. His head ached a tad, and he was certain that it was part of his quirk, but he filed it away for the moment. His mother had just mentioned her time as a pro, and she never went into detail about that around him. He still didn't even know why she retired in the first place, but he had been able to gather that she retired shortly before he was born. Something must have happened or had been happening for a while before I was born to make her so jaded. Her hatred for Endeavor feels almost personal, so maybe that has something to do with it. So, Nezu, what's the crisis? Inko finally asked. I don't believe it has reached crisis levels as of yet, Nezu began with a thoughtful hum, but I've recently come across evidence pointing towards the reformation of a long-thought-dead terrorist ideology. It was thought to be dead on an official capacity, at least. Inko frowned. A terrorist cell doesn't sound like something you'd contact me for. It does when it involves the reason your now-departed husband returned to attack your son, Nezu solemnly replied. Inko's gaze hardened into stone. So that's what the bastard was talking about, then? What do you mean? Izuku hesitantly inquired. Inko sighed. Hisashi was content with staying out of our lives when I informed him of your diagnosis. For years, I didn't even want to tell him that I was training you despite your status, but I felt he had the right to know. So, I called him and got him up to speed. He hung up on me the minute I made it clear that I supported you following your desires despite your quirk status, and I didn't hear a word from him after that. That was two weeks ago. Yesterday, when Hisashi showed up, he went on a rant about the quirkless being unevolved blights on mankind and that we should all have the rights to wield our meta-abilities freely, and having those without meta-abilities around only fills the need for laws restricting people's freedoms. He then said that he wouldn't stand for having a null rise above his station. It was around the time he spat a fireball at me and tried to break down your bedroom door that I handled him. Oh, was Izuku's simple reply. He did not know what to say to that. He was abrasive and rather opinionated when I met him, but blatantly spouting heavily quirkous sentiments is a new development. Although, maybe I shouldn't be surprised since he did back out when he thought he had a quirkless son. True colors, and all that. It's the terminology you say that he used that worries me, Nezu stated. It's straight from Destro's meta-liberation war and the movements it spawned. I thought Destro wrote that book after he was imprisoned, Inko asked. He did, and the bulk of his army was rounded up either and imprisoned or killed officially. Anyway, but many of the sentiments surrounding quirk liberation in his biography remained in a portion of society. That portion has only grown and festered over the years. While not outright supporters of Destro, there are several factions that align themselves with the basic premise of the original Meta Liberation Army. For the moment, their small pockets of pro-quirk activists, small-time villains, and terrorists leading indoctrination campaigns to bolster their numbers. And you think Hisashi fell victim to one of those? It is a possibility, I'm afraid. Inko sighed once more and ran a hand through her hair. Just great. Things can't ever be so simple. She paused, and she refocused her gaze onto the chimera. So, a collection of potential terrorists and cultists are festering around the country. That does sound concerning, but I wouldn't imagine it would be alarming for you. I've had some of my employees and some other unaffiliated heroes go undercover in a few of those cells, 
and they all came back with information that suggests a common thread between them. A singular benefactor sponsoring each cell, Nezu responded. Anyone of note? Potentially too much note. How so? They all led back to disposable shell companies of Detnerat. And with that, Inko was stressed. Her stress level had steadily been climbing over the course of the conversation, and the revelation that quirk supremacists were being funded by the already shady lifestyle support company worth billions didn't help matters one bit. However, something else stuck out to the former pro-hero. Earlier, you specified that they align with the ideals of the original Meta Liberation Army. Is there another Meta Liberation Army that we should know about? Inko hesitantly ventured. Mezu did not immediately respond, choosing instead to take a sip of his tea. Inko did not like that at all, as it was one of the creature's tells that he was stressed as well. Anything that had Nezu stressed was a high-priority threat that needed to be dealt with. I have my suspicions, Nezu carefully started. There has been a notable presence of Detnerat within Deka City as of late, and the CEO himself has spent quite a bit of time there. Not enough time to draw suspicion, but enough time to draw a few disturbing conclusions if you know what to look for. Deka, Inko tried to jog her memory. That's the weird city up in the sticks, right? Tens of thousands of people there who tend not to move out to anywhere else. Inko paled. Potentially tens of thousands of isolated people living within an MLA indoctrination camp, Nezu answered with a solemn nod. An army being gathered right under our noses. A heavy silence followed as the horrifying implications were readily apparent to all occupants, Izuku included. His brain was in overdrive trying to account for any and all possibilities and any ways to prevent a war from starting. His thoughts sped up, and he started running through several ideas, theories, and plans at a ridiculous pace. Young Midoriya, your hair has combusted again. Izuku did not flinch this time, as the white flame encompassed even more of his hair. Inko was mildly alarmed while Nezu was curious at the development. Izuku, paying no mind to either, mentally rewinded several instances at his school where the adults openly praised strong quirks and promoted a might-makes-right mentality while shunning and paying less attention to those with weaker quirks or anyone deemed to have less potential. How they treated him, the only quirkless student, went without saying. Looking up, the white-hot fire sitting atop his head flared a brief moment before Izuku met the gaze of the two adults. I think our school district is one of these indoctrination zones, he bluntly stated. Inko's eyes widened at the declaration, and Nezu hummed in consideration. How did you come to that conclusion, Midoriya? One of my teachers likely put a student with a strong quirk up to assaulting me after giving me detention yesterday. It was, ironically, why I wasn't home for my Faf Hisashi's return. Inko's eyes widened even further as it sank in for her as well. You believe that man is part of this whole operation? He's a cog in a larger machine, but yes, I've caught glimpses of what's in his and others' teachers' desks, and I might have seen a copy of Meta Liberation War in one or two of them, but that might just be confirmation bias at work. I can't say for sure. What I can say, however, is that in instances where I'm sent to the principal's office for one fabricated reason or another, I've seen some of the things he has on display. I doubt he keeps anything truly incriminating in his office, but he does have a strange mask that only goes over your eyes on his desk. I asked him about it once, and he said that it was a memento of an old revolutionary he studied in graduate school. He didn't explain any further, but he likely believed that a child as young as I am wouldn't ever be able to put the pieces together, so he didn't seem too bothered about letting that much slip. Can you draw the mask? Nezu asked. Yes, Izuku answered. I'll go grab a notebook before whatever is going on with my quirk dies down and I get the worst migraine of my life. He left to his room, and in no time at all, he returned with a notebook and quickly began sketching away. Nezu tilted his head to read what was written in the cover, and the phrase, Hero Analyzes for the Future of All, 8, grabbed his attention. Izuku looked to be finishing up, 
so he elected to put a pin in that thought for the moment. Upon finishing, he handed the notebook over to Nezu, and sure enough, it was Destro's mask exactly as it was printed on Meta Liberation War. He and Inko shared a glance and had a silent conversation. Izuku, meanwhile, immediately felt the effects of his quirk when the white fire on his head finally petered out, and the searing migraine came in with an ungodly vengeance. He slumped over on the couch and clutched at his head, causing his mother to leap from her seat and rush to his side. Izuku, are you all right? she worriedly prodded. Yes, he managed before taking a breath. I just need to not think for a bit. You overexerted your quirk, she fretted over him while Nezu took a look through the rest of the notebook, a growing look of intrigue developing on his face. The young boy had detailed analysis of pro-heroes and their quirks, including their strengths, weaknesses, how they could cover those weaknesses, and what improvements they could make with their quirks or support gear to think about trying out. A disturbing smile twisted onto the animal hybrid's face. Inko momentarily stilled, feeling the unrestrained glee in her comrade. That was never a good sign, and turning around to see her son's hero analysis notebook in his paws made her heart drop. Dear God, please don't let him turn my son into a mini-me. When Izuku managed to get back to a sitting position, Inko sat down next to him and ran her hand through his hair before focusing back on the chimera who sported a chilling smile. So, with all of that distressing information in mind, what did you need of me, specifically? Inko questioned. For now, I'm gathering allies and getting them up to speed. For the moment, I cannot be certain which pros are or are not sympathetic to the MLAS message but I want to be prepared in case I need to create another war council anytime soon. Does the commission or the national government know about any of this? The commission is, to my knowledge, aware of the existence of a reforming MLA, but directly attacking Detnarat and all its connections would do considerable damage to the Japanese economy, so there is a tentative stalemate in place. The national government is not aware of any of this, Otherwise, the JSDF would be storming Deka City as we speak. Should we, Inko ventured with hopeful gleam. I wouldn't recommend it. It would likely plunge the nation into a civil war that society isn't ready for, regardless of who comes out on top, Nezu verbally responded before sparing a glance at Izuku. The boy was still nursing his migraine and had his eyes closed, but he was clearly listening. Nezu silently signed to Inko in an old code developed on the field. Supervillain attack. All might out of commission. Duration indeterminable. Inko's eyes widened to the size of dinner plates, and she nodded in understanding. Things truly just could not have been simple. Exhaling, she pressed on. Anything else? Nezu's smile returned, and Inko already did not like where this was headed. I would like to offer you a job at Yua, of course. Izuku's eyes shot open at the animal hybrid's declaration, and his mouth was left agape. Inko wasn't faring any better. Excuse me? She choked out. Did I forget to mention that I am the principal of Yua? He cheekily responded. Yes, that may have slipped your mind, dear friend, Inko responded through gritted teeth. It was a development that occurred during your absence from heroics, Nezu began. It's my way of shaping future generations of heroes away from the Commission's influence, and, hopefully, to create less situations where fantastic heroes like yourself become too disillusioned with the ugly truth. Inko's glare softened, and she took a minute to gather the right words to respond to Nezu. To do that, you'd have to clean up the ugly truth that's hidden away. Oh, don't fret. Taking down the Hero Commission is next on my list after the MLA, Nezu happily responded. Inko couldn't help the chuckle that escaped her. Never change, rat. I also presume you will be pulling Izuku from his current school, given the knowledge that it is likely an MLA indoctrination center, he continued. Might I suggest my services in handling Izuku's schooling personally until he's old enough to take the UA entrance exam? Inko did not need to look at her son to know that he had practically melted at the offer. 
she refused to look in his direction so that she wouldn't fall victim to the puppy eyes that he'd almost certainly be wielding against her. She would not fall victim to it. She would not. She would not. God damn it, she did. Concurrently, Izuku was doing his very best to contain his excitement. He really did not want to accidentally activate the red flames of his quirk and torch the apartment. Throwing his best application of the puppy eyes with tears included, he silently pleaded with his mother to take the offer. She didn't even need to look at him to fall victim to his efforts if her resigned sigh was any indication. If I say yes, will you ensure that my son is in good, capable hands? Inko asked. She knew that she didn't need to ask that, as Nezu was probably the most capable person. She knew for this task. She just needed confirmation for herself that re-entering the hero sphere was the right decision. Of course, Nezu assured, a mind as brilliant as his truly deserves the best cultivation possible. You just want to groom him to be your successor for your world domination plots. I will neither confirm nor deny that statement. Uh, fine, I accept. Hell yeah, Izuku shouted, speaking up for the first time since his quirk deactivated and launching himself at his mother for a vice grip of a hug. Gladly returning it, she shot her guest a curious glance. What would I even be teaching? I've been thinking of creating an underground heroics course for the second and third years interested in going that route. We already have the space in the building, and, with you on board, I'll have an instructor for it. You won't begin until next school year, so you'll have this time until then to earn your certifications, Nezu explained. Inko nodded, wrangling her positively hyper son who was going on and on about attending Yua, studying under the principal himself, and potentially learning from his own mother in an official capacity. That was until something dawned on him. Wait, what does this mean for my training? he asked, slightly worried that the new routine would throw off his training schedule. Your current training should not be hampered, Nezu answered. In fact, you will have more opportunities to train even harder since you'll have access to U.S. training facilities. Izuku brightened at this initially. However, a chill crawled up his spine when he glanced at his mother. The vicious, toothy grin she was sending his way made his blood run cold, and for a single moment, Izuku wondered if he made a mistake. Well then, I'd like to humbly welcome you to our U.S. staff, Verdant. Nezu said after getting up from his chair and extending a paw. Inko flinched at the use of her hero name before sighing and shaking Nezu's offered paw. I suppose I have to get used to hearing that name again. One condition, though. Name it. I get to deal with Izuku's teacher personally. Only if I get to knock the school building down with a wrecking ball after flushing out the vermin. Deal. The soft sound of snickering made her turn to her son with an annoyed glare. Verdant? Really? Izuku managed through giggles. It was original at the time, Inko defended. And you have no room to poke fun, Mr. Snen's small mite. Touché, Izuku conceded with a smile. Inko did not waste any time withdrawing Izuku from his school come Monday morning. The principal put on a convincing act by wishing her son and herself well for the future, but she could see in his eyes that he was ecstatic to be rid of the quirkless boy. Apparently, Izuku's teacher did not inform his boss of the news after witnessing Izuku's healing act, or he hadn't had the opportunity to inform him yet. It didn't really matter to Inko. The school would burn and that teacher would feel her wrath all the same. She did use that meeting as an opportunity to scope out anything incriminating in the principal's office, though. It was a little more Spartan than her son had described, which was likely a result of her presence. The replica of Destro's mask was still present in a display case, though, so either he was too proud to hide that, or he was confident that a worrywart housewife wouldn't recognize it or pay it much attention. She'd have to make sure she got a picture of his face when everything came crashing down on him. No one messed with her son. Speaking of, she still needed to call Mitsuki about what happened between their respective sons. She didn't know if Katsuki had mentioned anything about it to her, but she hadn't called or texted her about it at all, 
So Inko figured that Katsuki's pride was a little wounded. She didn't want to hold anything against her best friend's son. Well, one of her best friend's sons, but that bastard Endeavor refused to let her help. She killed that train of thought and took a deep breath. Exhaling, she promised herself that she wouldn't think about that right then. The Katsuki matter was more crucial, especially if he's being exposed to MLA indoctrination. Finding her friend at the top of her contacts, she called her up. Hey, Inkai, what's up? You don't usually call during business hours. Must be important. Hi, Mitsuki. Did Katsuki tell you about what happened? There was a pause on the line, and Inko could tell that Mitsuki was hesitant to respond. Katsuki's been quiet these last few days. He's been more irritable than normal, too, and he spent all of his time in his room and wouldn't come out, not even to eat. I don't know what happened on Friday. He wouldn't tell me. I think I know what's causing that. He and Izuku got into a bit of a scuffle, and Izuku manifested his quirk. A powerful one, too. Wait, that's it? The little shit isn't top dog anymore, and he's nursing his pride? Ha! Serves him right. Hope this humbles him a little. Inko sighed into the phone. Yeah, but I wish that were the end of it. Did something happen to little Izu? Inko's voice became as hard as steel. No. The school, though, is a different story. There was another silence on the line. You're bringing out the hero voice. This must be serious. Izuku told me that Katsuki tried to viciously assault him in an alleyway after detention. After hearing Mitsuki gasp, she quickly continued. He thinks that one of the teachers specifically influenced Katsuki to do it, and I have reason to believe him. Oh my god, Inko, I'm so sorry. I had no idea that it was this bad. Inko filed that strange comment away for later. It's fine, Mitsuki. I mean, it isn't, and I wish it hadn't happened, but I don't blame Katsuki, at least not entirely. It's the main reason I'm calling, actually. The school district is poisoned. What do you mean? It's a rather long story, but let's just say that a collection of old-school quirk supremacists are trying to amass a considerable following in the country, and they've got hands in a bunch of places, school districts included, to start converting impressionable people. Our school district is one of them. Holy shit, do I even want to know how you got that information? Oh shit, is Verdon coming out of retirement? Mitsuki? I know, I know, I'm sorry, but this sounds like really serious business. If there was ever a time for the silent, green assassin to return, do not ever call me that again. Still a sore subject, gotcha? I'm sorry. Inko sighed once more. No, it's fine. You're not even wrong, I just haven't accepted it, yet. Regardless, we're getting off track. Right. Should I move Katsuki to a new district? That would be best for now. We still need to figure out just how far this influence has spread, though. I doubt this district is the only one in the city in need of a purge, so keep an eye out for anything fishy and I'll keep an ear to the ground for any further developments. I'll follow your lead, pro. Inko's long-suffering sigh only vindicated Mitsuki's smirk. I'll just tell him the principles of pedo if he asks questions. What are you planning to do for Izuku? Can't say. Better that I don't say, actually. Hero business, and all that. So you are getting back into the game, huh? Reluctantly, and only in an educator's capacity, but yes. At Mitsuki's inquisitive hum, she explained, I was offered a job by the principal of Yua. Given current events and potential future events, it was better that I took it. Ominous statements aside, I'm happy for you, Inko. She hesitated. I'm sure she would be, too. She's not dead, Mitsuki. I know, but I also know that you're not going to tell her any of this. Are you? Only if you want me to. I see her every month, you know. There was another pause. She misses you, and I know you miss her too. You should go see her. A much longer silence fell over them. I'll consider it. That's all I ask. If he shows up, 
I'll disintegrate him like I did to Hisashi. You did what? Realizing what she had revealed, Inko facepalmed. Right, you probably wouldn't have heard. Funny story, actually. Learning under Nezu was nothing short of exciting for Izuku. Not only was he being taught directly by an active pro hero, but, for what felt like the first time, he had seemingly met a true intellectual superior. He supposed he was smart frighteningly so for his age if his mother was to be believed, and he would even agree that his unnatural intelligence heavily contributed to his ostracism in school because quirkless kids aren't supposed to be that smart, but Nezu was on a completely different level. The first thing they did when Izuku arrived at Yua was play a game of chess at Nezu's insistence. The Chimera had seen his analytical skills at work, but he wanted to see if the boy had any knack for strategy, and if he could plan on the fly if necessary. Izuku had never played before, but Nezu assured him that he would learn as he went. And he did. He didn't win, of course. They played six games and Nezu handily defeated him each time, but each game was progressively more challenging for the super genius animal. He would even admit to second-guessing a move on one or two occasions. Nezu very much enjoyed picking Izuku's brain afterward, giving him hypothetical scenarios and mock investigations to work through. He also formulated a plan for continuing the informatics training that the boy's mother started him on and potentially getting him some practical experience in the field. Creating a general middle school curriculum for him to complete was child's play and he'd be sure to have Izuku complete it way ahead of schedule just for the official documentation. One thing that stood out to Izuku, however, was Nezu's insistence on him wearing quirk suppressant cuffs during every session. Nezu had a theory that he wanted to test out, and the best way to do that was to gauge Izuku's unassisted ick. What they found was that Izuku, even without the white flames, was still mentally exceptional, he was not as capable as he would be otherwise, but he was still well ahead of his peers. It gave credence to Nezu's theory that Izuku's quirk was an emitter with qualities of a mutation, which fascinated the Chimera. It potentially meant that at least a few aspects if not each aspect of his quirk came with a distinct mutation to handle to handle the upper limits more easily. It made Izuku a natural quirk Frankenstein of sorts, he made a decision during one such session to outline the possibilities. Izuku, tell me each aspect of your quirk that you currently know of, Nezu instructed. Oh, all right. Do you want a full breakdown or just what I suspect the individual flames can do? Izuku asked. Just the flames. I have a theory I want to test. Well, the base form of the quirk seems to be the conglomerate of all the flames. I registered it as kaleidoscopic fire for simplicity's sake. They're colorful and hotter than average, and they burn rainbows into concrete when I'm projecting hard enough. My mom told me to keep it at that and to not go into detail about each aspect on the record. A wise decision. Continue. Well, so far, I know of red, yellow, white, pink, and green flames. The red flames have thus far been triggered by happiness or excitement when my quirk is active. It acts as a sort of supercharged version of the base form. They're significantly hotter than any other flame I've tried out so far. I have a natural resistance to fire, and even I can really feel the heat when the red flames are at full blast, and my mom has to stand at least 10 feet away from me when we're training the upper limits of it. I've burned many outfits to ashes in the process. Interesting, Nezu spoke before taking a sip of tea from a cup he certainly did not have a second ago. Please, continue. Getting over his confusion at the phantom cup, Izuku moved forward with his explanation. The white, yellow, and green flames, I've surmised, can be classified in the same group. The white flames enhance my brain power, the yellow flames enhance my speed in short bursts and the green flames give me a pretty remarkable boost in strength. The downsides are that overusing them give me a migraine, strain my heart, and tear up my muscles, respectively. They all function like supercharged adrenaline. Fascinating. And the pink? I can heal injuries at the cost of my stamina. I've only had one opportunity to try it out on someone else, and it was just mending a few broken fingers. 
but I didn't notice any scarring or anything to suggest advanced healing. In fact, his fingers sort of straightened themselves back to their prior state as if the damage was being reversed rather than healed. It's sort of like the inverse of recovery girl's quirk, I guess. Nezu considered that point for a moment. Do you believe it to be within your capabilities to rebuild organs? Currently? No. It was a delayed reaction, but even healing those fingers took a lot out of me later on. Tending to the pain that the three other flames cause me takes more stamina than I'd like to admit, as well. I'd probably drain myself of everything I have and drop dead before I make any significant progress in an operation like that, at least right now. Nezu nodded and hummed in thought. I believe your quirk comes with a set of mutations that allow you to handle the strain of the individual flames better than most would. Pushing your limits and strengthening your endurance for each flame would be the most effective way to reduce the strain it causes you. I'll be sure to inform your mother about it so she can incorporate it into your training. Izuku maintained a calm facade on the outside, but he was internally sweating bullets. If Nezu was able to see through the mask, he didn't mention it. On a similar note, I'll set up some time for you to shadow Recovery Girl during the day so that you get some practice with the healing aspect of your fire. There are not nearly enough field medics in heroics today. Is that because healing quirks are rare, or is it that those with healing quirks usually just end up going into medicine rather than heroics, Izuku asked? A little of both. Recovery Girl is an anomaly amongst anomalies, Nezu chirped with a smile, and then his eyes flickered to a screen at the edge of his desk. Ah, he's right on time. Before Izuku could ask what the principal meant, there was a knock at the door. One enthusiastic, come in, from the chimera later, and the door opened to reveal a scraggly man with long black hair, a solid black outfit, and a long, white scarf. The man's eyes found Izuku immediately, and they narrowed in confusion. Aizawa, I'm glad you could make it, Nezu said with his trademark unsettling smile. You were expecting me? Aizawa queried, and then he immediately deflated. Of course, you were. Why am I even asking? It's good to ask logical questions, Aizawa. There are never any logical answers when you're involved, Aizawa huffed before pointing to Izuku. Who's the kid? He's my newest student, Izuku Midoriya. Aizawa narrowed his eyes even further at Izuku, seemingly trying to dissect him for everything he was worth. Izuku tried not to squirm under his gaze. He really did. He seems a little young to be a student here, Aizawa blandly pointed out. That's because he isn't yet. He still has a few more years until he can apply and become my official protege, Nezu answered. I doubt that's why you came here, however. Sparring a final glance at Izuku as if he were trying to remember a vaguely familiar face, Aizawa turned back to his boss. You hired a new teacher halfway through the year. I just wanted to figure out why. I haven't met them yet, before you ask. Nezu took a sip of tea from a cup that Aizawa swore he did not have just a second prior. Things are happening out in our small world and it's important to prepare for potential worst-case scenarios. Cryptic, and doesn't tell me anything, Aizawa grunted. Does the name Verdant mean anything to you? Nezu posed. The sudden widening of Aizawa's eyes told Nezu and Izuku that it did. Now, Izuku was interested. His mom told him that she wasn't particularly popular publicly, but she was known well enough in the underground. Izuku didn't really recognize the man in front of him. But he knew that pro heroes taught at UA, so he assumed that he was an underground hero as well. Maybe they worked together in the past? She's part of why I even got into underground heroics. She dropped off the face of the planet a little over a decade ago, and a lot of people assume that she's dead. Why? Ah, inspiration. It's cool that she inspired people as an underground pro. I wonder if she had merch. I assure you that she's very much alive. Izuku can attest to that. Aizawa's stare bored into Izuku even harder than before. Try as he might, the boy fidgeted under the intense gaze until he was saved by said gaze flickering to Nezu in suspicion. 
That reprieve was short-lived, however, as the man's eyes returned to him and planted him in his seat. Recognition soon blossomed within Aizawa, and he faced Nezu with more emotion in than the man thought possible. You've got to be shitting me. Over the following years, Izuku's training had ramped up considerably on several fronts. He had long since completed middle school with Nezu and focused primarily on improving his strategy and tactical acumen as well as his analytical prowess. When they weren't discussing potential wartime scenarios, Nezu was even getting Izuku's opinions on how to improve U.S. security to avoid potential villain attacks or infiltration. Over time, Nezu found that he was running out of things to teach the hero hopeful, and that made him positively ecstatic. The feeling was not shared amongst the Yua faculty whom all lamented in despair at the prospect of having two Nezus when Izuku officially started attending the school. Power Loader in particular wanted to be as far away from Izuku as possible. The boy wasn't a support technician by any means, but when that cursed white fire made an appearance whenever he was in or near the development studio for whatever reason, the schematics for support items he'd whip up made the man both salivate and shudder in fear. Anyone who could conceptualize a pair of nail clippers that somehow managed to violate the Geneva Conventions didn't need to be anywhere near a support lab. His experiences with the other faculty were varied. Aizawa he still hadn't figured out which pro-hero the man was maintained a healthy distance from him out of respect and fear of his mother. But he was largely cordial otherwise. Present Mike, after hearing his best friend recount the story of Verdant ending a hostage situation by taking the villain's gun with her quirk and literally shooting him in the foot with it, decided to exercise the same amount of caution. But he still offered Izuku a bright and overly loud greeting when they saw each other. Midnight, however, had taken to him the fastest, positioning herself as the cool aunt when she saw his analysis of her and her quirk when they first met. Izuku's idea of using her quirk to create somnambulist smoke bombs solidified his place as her favorite unofficial student. Physical training had intensified the most. When he started to get older and began approaching the age in which he'd attempt the entrance exam, his mother decided that it was time to take the kid gloves off. Izuku didn't believe her at first because he never once got the impression that she was ever going easy on him. She quickly dispelled that notion in their next spar. And the next one. And the one after that. And every spar after that. That led Izuku, now 14 years old, to his current predicament. You're gonna have to be a lot faster than that if you hope to land a hit. Izuku huffed in frustration at his mother's taunt. They'd been at it for 15 minutes, and he had yet to land a single hit on her. They had been training in ground beta on a Saturday to ensure they had the place to themselves, and Izuku was tasked with landing five hits on Inko. Ordinarily, this wouldn't be such an arduous task. Over the years, Izuku had begun to catch up with his mother in height and strength, so with a simple application of yellow flames to even the playing field in speed, he could keep pace with her in a traditional spar. This was not a traditional spar. Izuku was instructed to only attack from a distance by using his kaleidoscopic fire in projectile form. He was allowed to stream it, launch fireballs, create colorful explosions, etc., he could use any techniques or applications of his flames at his disposal so long as he landed five hits. It was the reverse of the dodge training that still haunted Izuku's nightmares nine years later. The problem was that his mother was not holding back anymore. She didn't attack, sure, but she had decades of training and real-world experience on him, and she was using every bit of it to remain just out of Izuku's reach every time. He'd launch a fireball at her and she'd dodge it with minimal effort. He'd immerse both hands in fire and unleash a barrage of fireballs in a single area to pepper her with burns, and she'd narrowly escape being tagged by the slimmest of margins by employing some, frankly, bullshit feats of athleticism and flexibility. He'd engulf each arm in a brilliant blaze and launch twin waves of mosaic inferno that converge to create a violently colorful sea of fire for no other reason than to remove any places that she could escape to. 
In response, she'd kick through a car window and use the newly unlocked car door as cover from the inferno before ultimately escaping through the other side of the car and up the fire escape of a building, all without so much as a burn on her. It was truly maddening for the teen. Think, Izuku, you're not using your head in fights anymore, she shouted at him from atop a building overlooking the colorful sea of fire. Her comments were also not helping matters at all. Izuku had no idea how to even approach a problem like that. He couldn't touch her if she only focused on evasion. His flames just weren't fast enough, apparently, and she can weasel her way out of just about any trap he tried to rope her into. What the hell do you do when you can't get so much as a glancing blow on your opponent? You certainly don't stand around and mutter while your opponent sneaks up behind you. Izuku jumped out of his skin when he heard her voice next to his ear, unconsciously turning a bright crimson and nearly igniting the red flames in all directions. He got a hold of himself before he could actually do any damage, and he was stuck as a panting mess with his hands on his knees. Let's break here, Inko said softly. You did really well. Izuku looked up at her, his face practically dripping with incredulity. I didn't land a single hit on you. You weren't supposed to. At his puzzled expression, she explained, this exercise was meant to both humble you and gauge your current maximum. You're good, really good for someone your age, certainly, and the fact that I had to try as hard as I did only proved that. With that said, being around pros all the time that complement your abilities and progress might have inflated your ego a little bit. What happened today was to remind you that there's a massive gulf between where you are currently and anyone with a decent amount of actual experience. Izuku took the explanation with a constipated expression. He knew that, logically, she was right, and it was a bitter pill to swallow. She had been keeping away from every single one of his attacks and making it look easy. Had she ever actually decided to attack, he wouldn't have stood a chance. That fact really ate at him. On the other hand, he was specifically limited in what he could do by the rules of the exercise, but he supposed that she limited herself as well by never going on the offensive. As a pure test of his ability to hit a constantly moving target, it was a fair one, right? Had he been able to move in and attack from close range, he would have scored a hit and done much better, right? Right? He was pulled out of his spiral by a hand on his shoulder and his mother's concerned expression. Are you okay? she asked with a hint of worry in her voice. Izuku took a few seconds to gather his thoughts. He nodded, and his face became resolute with determination. Yeah, I'm good. I just need to get better. I need to get stronger. I need to improve. I need to prove that training me wasn't a waste of your time. Unaware of his errant thought, Inko gave him a warm smile. And you will. I truly believe that. A few days had passed since the reality check training session, and Inko had been away in Mai to investigate a lead on a trigger operation for Nezu. Having the house to himself and given the day off by Nezu, Izuku found himself alone with only his thoughts. The training session and following discussion kept replaying in his mind, and each time, the conclusion left an even more bitter taste in his mouth. Almost a decade of training, and I'm still nothing in comparison to her, to any pro, he lamented while sitting on the edge of his bed. Clenching his fists, he could feel the heat within him pulse in response to his emotions. It wasn't anything he was unfamiliar with since his quirk had periodically hummed and fluctuated with his mood in the past. However, something else was there. It was only for a moment, but Izuku felt a brief spark of darkness, he struggled to find any other words to describe the sensation, but he felt a twinge of black within the spark. It was gone as soon as it appeared, and it did not feel particularly inviting to him, which made him wary. With a huff, he decided to go for a jog through the neighborhood to clear his mind of any self-doubt and quirk-related nonsense. Not having any particular destination in mind, he set off into the cool, spring morning, he ended up slowing down near Dagoba Beach, and on a whim, he changed direction and entered the unofficial dumping grounds. Meandering through the piles of trash for a few minutes, he took in the sorry state of the polluted beach. 
He then exited the garbage fortress and returned to the roadside, getting an overview of the place. Anyone wanting a nice view of the ocean would be sorely disappointed. Someone really needs to come clean this place, he muttered to no one. They really do, spoke a voice next to him. It took everything Izuku had to not jump out of his skin. He turned his head and fixed the new arrival with a pointed glare. Either my situational awareness has really become piss poor, or you have experience sneaking up on young teenagers, Izuku said with a little more bite than was probably necessary. The man proceeded to hack a concerning amount of blood at Izuku's statement. Oh my god, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to startle you so badly that I'd harm you, are you okay? Here, let me help. Izuku frantically sputtered out while trying to apply a hand bathed in pink fire to the man's chest. The man tried to assure Izuku that he was fine, sparing curious glances at the strange fire in the boy's hand. Izuku was finally able to get a good look at the guy that snuck up on him. He was a tall, rail-thin man with blonde hair and sunken blue eyes. He had a handkerchief in hand with older bloodstains on it. So Izuku assumed that he had some sort of condition and was used to the occurrence. What's a youngster like you doing out here on this beach? The man asked him. I was out for a jog to clear my head, and I just kinda ended up here, I guess, Izuku answered. Trouble at home? No, well, not entirely. Would you like to talk about it? That usually helps. It's nothing major, really. I've just been training for a while, and I don't know if I'm living up to expectations. The blonde man nodded and motioned for him to sit on a nearby bench. What are you training for, if I may? The man asked as the two sat down. A faint smile made its way to Izuku's face. To be a hero. I've wanted to be one for as long as I could form complete sentences. The man hummed approvingly, his blonde hair billowing in his face with the breeze. Why do you want to be a hero, young man? Izuku opened his mouth to answer, but he paused, and he remained silent for a few moments to really think about the question. His first instinct was to say that he wanted to be the best damn hero to come out of Musutafu, like he declared when he was five. But why? When I was really young, I idolized All Might. He did not notice the slight twitch from the older man at the mention of All Might, Hell, I still kinda do. He's so ridiculously powerful and heroic, and I wanted to be just like him. I wanted to be a hero and save people with a blinding smile just like he does. Then, I was diagnosed as quirkless. The man's eyes slightly widened and he raised an eyebrow. And you're still training to be a hero? Well, that's the thing. I was either misdiagnosed, or I was just a late bloomer, Izuku answered with a chuckle. Either way, I have a quirk now, but even back when I thought I didn't, my mother was willing to train me to become a hero without one. She wanted to help me follow my dream, quirk status be damned. She sounds like a great mother. Well, I don't really have any other mothers to compare her to, so I'll have to agree for now, Izuku joked. The man chuckled, and his eyes became somewhat vacant while he looked over Izuku, as if he was seeing someone else. Shaking it off, he allowed the boy to continue. I trained with her for years in everything she thought I'd need to know to become a competent hero without any inherent advantages. I learned how to defend myself, evade danger, investigate, and how to defuse situations, all without the use of a quirk. And then my quirk came in, and everything changed, I guess. I could no longer become the best quirkless hero ever, so I had to pivot to just being the best hero ever. But, why? I still want to save people with a smile and instill a sense of hope with my presence like all might. But isn't that something every hero should aspire to do? He paused. I guess I really want to be a pillar for those at the bottom of society, like the quirkless and the mistreated, but can I really live up to a goal like that when I don't even know if I can live up to my own mom's legacy? Legacy? His mom must be a retired pro. Then... I wonder if I've heard of her, the man mused to himself. Izuku sighed. What am I even training for, you know? Sometimes I feel like I'm making no tangible progress, while the end goal still feels as nebulous as ever. 
I don't want the effort my mom put into me to go to waste. And I want to feel like I'm doing all of this for something, you know? I do, the man softly replied. I'm certain that your mother would be proud of you regardless of what kind of hero you become. Yeah, Izuku conceded with a chuckle. She would. She always would. I just don't often feel like I deserve it these last few years. He stood up from the bench and started to stretch his back and shoulders. Well, I have ten months until the Yua entrance exam. I guess I have until then to figure it out. You will, the man assured him with a smile. I'm sure of it. You already have the makings of an excellent hero if you're asking these questions now rather than later on. Izuku, for some reason he couldn't at all identify, momentarily felt weightless at the praise. It was strange, but he paid it no further mind. Thank you, um, you can call me Yagi. Okay, thank you, mister. Yagi, my name's Izuku Midiriya. Keep an eye out for that name in the future. Feeling reinvigorated, Izuku waved a small goodbye and continued his jog back in the direction of his home. Yagi watched him leave with a small, fond smile. That boy reminds me so much of Sensei. I wonder if he's the one. Internally, Yagi could feel one for all seemingly hum in agreement. And longing? Inko stood with Nezu on her shoulder across the street from a school that was swarmed by a collection of police, curious civilians, and the media. The duo of retired pro hero and Chimera watched as another set of teachers was escorted from the building in handcuffs, the reporters on scene scrambling to get statements from anyone they could about the developing series of school districts that had been infiltrated by Quirkus terrorists. The two were drinking celebratory slushies Nezu's being tea-flavored at another MLA scheme foiled. This school was the last of the 12th district by their count across Japan that had been seized, and they were beginning to realize just how insidious the issue had truly been. Once one went down, several more accidentally revealed themselves by going on high alert. Occasionally, some teachers that either weren't buying into the scheme or had suspicions of a conspiracy going on within the faculty sent in anonymous reports about their schools. The former led to a lot more indoctrination plots being revealed, whereas the latter still brought some to light but often unearthed even more unsavory happenings. There was one particular school in Hiroshima that was discovered to not be a quirk supremacy racket but it instead groomed those with decently powerful quirks toward the path of heroics, and then if they failed the entrance exam to their school of choice, they would be kidnapped and sold off to a mystery buyer. Nezu had yet to identify who was buying the kids, try as he might. The two watched on as the media converged on another set of police with guilty staff members in tow. We're working our way up to Deka, right? Inko asked, taking another sip from her slushy. Eventually, Nezu confirmed. I don't doubt that attacking the small cells of extremists and the school districts they've infected have tipped them off. So it wouldn't surprise me if they've sequestered themselves in Deka and ramped up their timeline. Do we have to worry about any stragglers making their way over there to join their ranks? Inko questioned. Not likely, Nezu began. So far, interrogations haven't revealed anything about Detnerat or any modern iterations of the MLA. Those who have been questioned only revealed their connections to various quirk supremacy groups. Some even had ties to the Creature Rejection Clan of all things, and as such, the crackdowns appear as a nationwide move against quirk discrimination of any kind rather than a specific move against a terrorist group. And that's the story the media is running with, Inko sighed. It appears so. So, no great loss for the MLA either way. At least we took down their undercover immersive propaganda machine. Although, I'm curious as to what the point of it all was if they weren't creating soldiers with it. Nezu hummed in consideration while taking a sip from his tea slushy. Staging an insurrection and sparking an inevitable civil war for an antiquated ideology is one thing. Doing so with a population who are already sympathetic to the fundamental principles of that ideology is another thing entirely. These indoctrination camps were just set up to preemptively get the populace amenable to their cause for when they do decide to move. 
it makes it a much more difficult battle for the government to fight. Well, I suppose anti-discrimination isn't exactly quirk liberation, so they're no closer now to that goal than they were before our crusade, Inko concluded. Perhaps, but I'm not naive enough to think that they can't work with this. Fighting discrimination against mutation quirks is somewhat tangential to quirk liberation. There's enough of a thread there to latch onto if they have a competent PR team. Let's hope they don't, Inko slumped, finishing her slushy. We all done here? Indeed, let us return to Yua. The entrance exam needs planning, the Chimera excitedly chirped. About that, Inko began, and she started the trek back to Yua with her boss still on her shoulder. Is Izuku taking the recommendation exam? Mizu hummed in consideration once more at the question. I considered it at first given his circumstances, but his admittance into the hero course is a foregone conclusion at this point. There are only four available spots for recommended applicants, so it would be wasteful to cut it down to three right off the bat and boot an applicant down to the general exam whom otherwise would have qualified. That's strangely considerate of you, Inko replied with narrowed eyes and suspicion coloring her voice. I also wouldn't get to throw scores of robots at him in the recommendation exam, he joyfully added. Ah, there it is, she dryly replied. Even though he had spent the better part of five years at Yua, walking through the gates for the entrance exam was still a surreal feeling for Izuku. The first step to starting his pro-hero career was upon him, and he was going to grab it by the horns. He was going to seize the moment. He was. Out of my way, extra. Falling. He was falling. So surprised by the shockingly familiar voice and ash-blonde head of hair on the boy who shoved past him, he almost forgot to write himself to avoid eating shit before he even made it into the building. However, a hand hurriedly slapped his shoulder before he could stop his fall, and he felt gravity leave him. The end result was Izuku floating just above the ground in a perpetual loop of front flips due to the inertia he carried with him. Oh no, a high-pitched voice beside him intoned before his steady path toward the building was halted. Izuku saw the upside-down figure of a girl with auburn brown, shoulder-length hair attempting to write him. Upon doing so, she tapped her fingertips together, and Izuku felt gravity return to him. What a fascinating quirk, he thought while appraising the girl. Sorry, I hope you don't mind me using my quirk on you. It would have been a bad omen if you fell, is all. I didn't notice you already had it covered, though, she nervously sped out with a sheepish smile. It's fine, Izuku absentmindedly responded. Your quirk is so cool, how does it work? Oh, the girl was a little flustered at the excitement she could see in his eyes directed at her or, more likely, her quirk. It's called zero gravity. I can remove the gravity of anything I touch with five fingers and then restore it by putting my fingers on both hands together. My name's Ochako Yuroraka, by the way. Ochako was not anticipating her day to begin like this. She was simultaneously pumped and cripplingly nervous about taking the entrance exam for the best hero school in the nation. And when she left her mostly bare apartment that morning, she didn't know what to expect. Obviously, she'd be taking a written test and some sort of physical exam, but she didn't know what it entailed, what kind of people she'd meet, or if she'd potentially make any friends. She was certainly not expecting an admittedly cute boy to stare directly into her soul with childlike wonder as she explained her quirk and then mutter up a storm about the possible applications of her quirk in the field and how great of a hero she could become. It was actually pretty nice in her opinion, in a weird sort of way. She could feel some of the dread in her stomach diminish as he spoke. He seemed to realize that he was muttering and quickly clamped his mouth shut, much to her slight dismay. Sorry, that sometimes happens when I encounter something cool, or complex, or peculiar, it happens a lot, okay? Izuku was saved any more embarrassment by Ochako's giggling. We should really get going to the exam. We wouldn't want to be late. My name's Izuku Midoriya, by the way. Ochako nodded in acquiescence with a smile, already feeling much better than she had been when she arrived. 
The two entered the building and registered, making light conversation along the way to the testing rooms which primarily consisted of Ochako carrying the brunt of the conversation with Izuku stumbling along as best as he could. If she noticed, she didn't mention it, and Izuku was grateful. She was bubbly enough for the both of them. Along the way, Ochako noticed that he hadn't once looked at the map they were given to get to the testing rooms. Have you been here before? You know your way around pretty well, she asked with curiosity coloring her already rosy cheeks. Izuku was not prepared for that question, and it must have shown in his face because Ochako quickly tried to backpedal. Oh, you don't have to say if you don't want to, she said while frantically waving her hands. No, no, it's fine, he clumsily assured. He did not expect to have to reveal the fact that he was trained at Yua already. Frankly, he wasn't planning on saying anything about it unless it came up, and he really didn't want to potentially scare away the first person his age that he had spoken more than a few words to in years. But he felt that taking the out she gave him and not answering the question would be a little suspicious. Eh, screw it. My mom works here, Izuku simply stated. Really? That's so cool, Ochako piped up, and they both left it at that. Reaching the testing areas, they wished each other luck and parted ways. Izuku entered the room and found his seat, noticing ectoplasm in the front of the classroom with a stack of papers. He held in his excitement over a pro-hero administering the exam despite the fact that he had met ectoplasm several times before, and he waited for the testing to begin. They had two hours to answer 100 questions and an opinion piece essay on what they believed a hero should be. He figured that it would have been more challenging than that, but he didn't complain. When he finished, he checked the clock and saw that only 45 minutes had passed. He didn't even need to wave ectoplasm over, as one of his clones appeared beside his desk to collect his test. Principal Nezu figured you'd finish early, the hero said in his deep, vaguely mechanical voice. Izuku still found it so cool. You can hang out in the courtyard until it's time for the practical. Izuku nodded and pointedly ignored the stares and glances he received as he left the room. Closing the door, he let go of the deep breath he had unknowingly been holding. Being around other kids was something he'd really have to get used to again. Finding a bench to sit down on in the courtyard, Izuku decided to kill the next hour and fifteen minutes by reading Hero News. He saw the usual stuff, recent debuts, big takedowns of villains and other criminals, gossip surrounding heroes in the top ten, etc. However, one particular headline caught his eye. Sludge villain still at large in Musatafu. His interest peaked. He read the article that detailed a criminal made of sludge who robbed a store and evaded capture from. All Might? All Might's in Musatafu. Continuing to read, the article went on to explain that the sludge villain, as they're calling him, escaped detection by entering the body of a civilian and disappearing into the crowd, likely killing them in the process. Since then, there was a string of robberies and murders that police were connecting to the sludge villain, using the body of his victim, and potentially swapping into others when necessary. Well, that's comforting, Izuku sardonically said to himself. I'll tell Mom to be on the lookout. He scrolled a little further, and another headline caught his attention. Is Yue parading child soldiers rather than creating heroes? The F, he questioned, skimming through the article for its author and publisher. Chido's Kazuki, Shueisha Publishing. Should I tell Nezu about this? He considered it for a moment before shaking his head. No, he's probably already seen this. If not, I shouldn't trouble him with some random hit piece. Getting lost in the hero news for the next hour was easy enough and the time for him to make his way towards the auditorium was approaching. Looking up from his phone, he unconsciously activated his quirk and lit his hand ablaze with the familiar rainbow of flame. Manipulating and fanning the flame in his hands to kill a little more time, he felt a pair of eyes on him, and he turned to the left to see someone else with him in the courtyard. She had black, shoulder-length hair that was similar in style to Yuroraka's but longer. She wore a stoic expression, but Izuku could somewhat make out a bit of curiosity in her gaze. 
I guess she wasn't expecting anyone else to finish early, either, he thought as they returned each other's unblinking stare. Oddly enough, there wasn't any awkward tension amid the silence. Her eyes traveled to his hand, and they fixed themselves on the unique fire he wielded. Conversely, his eyes traveled to her right hand to see a handful of what he could make out to be sand. He noticed her eyes on his hand, and she realized that his eyes were on hers, and they came to a silent agreement. Izuku fanned and brightened the flame. Meanwhile, the girl picked up a small rock with her left hand and enlarged it to the point where it barely fit in her hand. Pocketing the sand, the girl shrunk the rock back to its original size and seemed to hesitate for a moment. Then she nodded to herself and approached Izuku with her phone in hand. Curious about her intentions, he killed the flame and watched her make her way toward him. She stopped beside the bench, sat down on the edge with a measure of distance between them, and she handed him her phone with the new contact page open. Izuku was momentarily dumbstruck before everything clicked and he gingerly took the phone and added himself to her contacts before handing it back to her. She silently took it, and then she flew into the fastest, most furious texting speed that Izuku had ever witnessed. His phone vibrated, and he saw that he had a text from an unknown number. Hi, I'm Yui Kodai. Sorry about all of this, I'm not great with social interaction. Your quirk is really cool. Izuku was taken aback for the fourth time since he got to the courtyard, but he didn't mind it this time around. Rather than answering her verbally and potentially make her feel awkward or obligated to speak up, he responded to her text in kind. It's nice to meet you too, Kodai. Don't worry, I was pretty much homeschooled, so my social skills aren't the best, either. Your quirk is amazing. Is that what the sand in your pocket is for? Yui's phone vibrated, and a small smile broke through her stoic visage. She replied to his text within seconds. Izuku really needed to learn how the hell she typed so quickly. Thank you, and yes, I can enlarge the grains to create a barrage of projectiles, or I could just toss sand in someone's eyes. Depends on how I'm feeling. Failing to fight back a snort at her text, Izuku checked the time and saw that they only had ten minutes to make it to the auditorium. We should start heading back to the building. The practical will be starting soon. Mm, she simply responded in agreement. She stood up to make her way back, but she stopped and appeared to deliberate something in her head. Making up her mind, she turned around to face him. You can call me Yui, she finally said before turning away once more and walking back into the building. Izuku stared in mild shock at the development before the same small smile formed onto his own face. Upon reaching the auditorium, Izuku checked the note card that had his seat number, and he found it in the back next to a boy with purple hair even wilder than his own and bags under his eyes to a level he had only seen on Mr. Aizawa. The boy spared him a lazy, cold glance before refocusing on the stage. Izuku thought about saying hi and potentially making a third friend that day, but the other boy didn't look like he was in the mood. He kept his excitement in check when present Mike showed up, and he made sure not to mutter aloud to keep from annoying the boy next to him. Pretty soon, the rules were explained and the examinees were loaded up onto buses to be sent off to the exam zones. Izuku was trying to keep the nerves at bay to varying degrees of success, he knew that he wasn't unprepared, but the idea of everything he trained all those years for finally coming to a head in the coming exam naturally put him on edge a bit. He hoped that Yuraraka or Yui, he still hadn't gotten over being on a first-name basis with someone again, and so quickly were doing okay. At the starting zone of their exam, Izuku was running through his stretches when he spotted Yuraraka on the other side warming up as well. She was slightly trembling, so it was clear to him that she wasn't doing any better than him on the nervousness front. He elected to go over and attempt to ease her nerves, but movement in his periphery made him tense up. Certain that it wasn't a threat, he allowed the hand of a taller boy with glasses to clamp down onto his shoulder. Giving the taller boy a curious look, he saw the other boy looking down at him with a stern countenance. That girl looks like she's busy preparing for the exam, the boy started, his glare tightening on Izuku. 
Do you intend to distract her and the other real participants here? Are you perhaps an impediment planted by the school to hinder us during the exam? Taking a moment to recognize the boy as the one from the auditorium that interrupted present Mike, Izuku quirked an eyebrow at him. Do you see the worst in everyone, or are you just really intense? At the taller boy's aghast sputtering, he continued, ignoring the many pairs of eyes that were watching the scene unfold. I know the girl over there, she's a friend. She seemed nervous, so I was going to try to help ease her mind for the exam. Also, he pried the boy's hand off of his shoulder. I saw you coming, and I figured you weren't a threat, so I didn't do anything to you when you grabbed me. Had I not seen you, I can't promise that the bones in your hand would still be in working order. Don't sneak up on people in a bid to intimidate them. It's bad for your health. Now, I'm going to go encourage my friend to do her best on this exam. Is that okay with you? Not waiting for a reply from the completely mortified boy, Izuku turned back around and walked away from him and the wide-eyed stares of the other participants. He had no idea where the hell all that even came from. He figured that he'd spent way too much time with his mother over the years. Start, blared the voice of present Mike over the intercom as the gate to the training ground swung open. Izuku flew into action, darting toward Yuraka and tapping her on the back to snap her out of the shared stupor that everyone was in at the sudden announcement. What are you all waiting for? Present Mike came over the intercom again. There are no countdowns in the real world. Those two up front have the right idea. The collection of examinees looked to see Izuku blasting off in a vibrant blaze with Ochako hurriedly bounding in behind him before they all rushed in themselves. Izuku, bathed in the familiar heat of his quirk, launched himself toward a group of one-pointers and blasted each one with a fireball, quickly disabling them before bounding off again into the heart of the city. Scores of faux villains attempted to intercept him in all manner of ways, but Izuku was ready for them. Pausing his base flames and igniting a bright yellow, he dodged and weaved through the rubber bullets, claws, pincers, and the occasional missile with Nezu's face on it. He'd be sure to have a talk with the principal after the exam about that last one. Letting green fire overtake his arms, he launched himself toward the robots and cleaved right through them, not paying any particular attention to their point values. Without a moment's hesitation, he grabbed a large panel from one of the robots he'd taken down and batted another robot away with it. Then he pivoted to block a third faux villain's attack from behind with that same panel. Pushing the panel into the robot, the emerald flames engulfed his legs for him to jump and drive his heel into the head of the machine, disabling it in an explosion. Reaching the ground, he let the green flames die down and swallowed the pain he began to feel in his muscles igniting his base flames again to relax some of the pain away for the moment. It was then that he noticed that the other examinees had made their way into the city as well, attempting to keep clear of him and the carnage in his wake. In a dark control room, a group of adults watched over the exam with careful scrutiny. The many screens showed different vantage points of each exam area, and they got to see the various approaches that the participants took. One screen showed a blonde blowing the robots to kingdom come, while laughing maniacally and sporting an equally maniacal gleam in his eye. That boy warranted further observation. Another screen displayed the tall boy who had the unfortunate run-in with Izuku kicking through the robots with ease. He then used the engines in his legs to blast off to the next one, though he seemed careful to stay out of the way of the trail of colorful fire ahead of him. On another, a duo of three-pointers had cornered a girl with pale gray hair covering one of her eyes until a barrage of giant grains of sand intercepted them and took down one of the three-pointers, allowing for the gray-haired girl to telekinetically smack the remaining robot with the pieces of the former. The two gave each other a silent thumbs-up and nod before heading off in different directions. Good crop this year, Midnight spoke up. A lot of hot-blooded action around. Behave, Aizawa tiredly commanded, also keeping a close eye on the screen, or, rather, one screen in particular. He wasn't the only one, either. Three other people had an eye on one particular screen, 
and that screen showed Izuku leaving a trail of mangled parts and whimsical fire in his wake. Mezu watched on with his usual smile, Yagi watched quietly and attentively, and Inko watched with an unmistakable smile full of pride for her son. That pride grew even more when he seemingly bounced from building to building onto a light post before diving into the middle of a group of faux villains that were ganging up on a short boy with purple balls for hair. The boy was clearly being overwhelmed, and when one of them opened fire with rubber bullets on the boy's blind spot, Izuku leaped in and blocked the boy from harm with his own body. If that wasn't crazy enough, Izuku's colorful fire had become a solid orange and flattened out into a seemingly solid barrier that the bullets bounced right off of. That's new, Inko said loudly enough for the others to hear. Indeed, Nezu agreed. I've never seen his fire become a solid orange. It must have manifested recently. You know that boy? Yagi asked the principal. He hadn't been around for very long so he was surprised that Nezu knew the boy he remembered from Dagaba Beach. Why, of course, he's my protege, Nezu answered. Yagi did not expect that at all. He considered Izuku even more carefully, now more sure of his feeling that the boy might be the right candidate to be his successor if he had already gotten the super genius Chimera's attention. He watched as the boy stared quizzically at the wall of orange flames surrounding him for a moment before shrugging and rolling with it, turning to say something to the shorter boy that was staring back up at him with something akin to reverence. They spoke back and forth before seeming to come to an agreement, and Izuku kneeled down for the short boy to hop onto his back. The orange wall dissipated, and the newly formed duo leaped above the robots onto a street light. The shorter boy on Izuku's back then started pulling the balls from his head and throwing them at the robots, sticking them to the ground and getting into their joints to stall them so that Izuku could launch a powerful fireball at the vulnerable group, destroying them. Suffice to say, all of the faculty in the command center were pleased at the scene for both examinees. Midnight, in particular, had a few comments. Ugh, such a magnificent display of selflessness and ingenuity. It gets me hot, she began before stopping when she felt death trickle up her spine. Looking over, she saw Inko side eyeing her across the room, much too still for the R-rated heroine's comfort. Go ahead, Inko calmly said. Finish that sentence. Midnight did not, in fact, finish that sentence, and she fearfully shrunk back into her seat. I warned you to behave, Aizawa chided the vindicated smirk he sported hidden behind his scarf. Unbeknownst to Aizawa and Midnight, Yagi had shrunk into his seat as well. The aura of murder that Inko radiated reminded him too much of his former senseis when she'd get angry. One for all seemed to agree as well, as he felt the quirk buzzing even more than when he encountered Izuku. He'd have to investigate it further later on. I think it's time to unleash the final obstacle, Nezu remarked and pressed a big, red button. Izuku would gladly admit that he was truly having fun. He hadn't ever gotten the chance to cut loose like this before, as he didn't often unleash the full brunt of his flames while training with his mom, and if he did, they never hit their target. Now, however, Izuku could do all the damage he wanted to disposable targets and practically fly around the testing area without fear of an rank threat kicking him in the jaw. He even discovered a new aspect of his quirk. Apparently, the orange part of his flames acted as a protective barrier that he only needed to concentrate on to maintain. That meant that he now had access to red, white, yellow, green, pink, and orange. It was such a fascinating development that he couldn't help but analyze the possibilities. The ground began to shake, snapping him out of his muttering and toward the edge of the city. In the distance was a behemoth of a machine, dwarfing the buildings and completely towering over the examinees. Izuku took a long look at the Goliath ahead, and he turned to give a flat glare at the camera bot conveniently standing beside him. He knew Nezu was watching him, and he hoped that he got his message across with the glare. Before he could turn and leave with the other participants, he spotted something odd a good ways ahead. Under a pile of rubble, he saw someone struggling against the ground. Hurrying forward to help them out, 
He grew alarmed when he recognized that it was Yuraraka pinned under the rubble. Igniting his yellow flames, he bolted past the fleeing participants towards the Zero Pointer. Arriving in no time, he assessed the situation. His new and one of only two friends was stuck, and she couldn't reach the concrete on her ankle to make it weightless. Without a second thought, he pushed the ever-looming Zero Pointer from his mind and ignited in a flash of green quickly grabbing and tossing the concrete off of her before picking her up into a bridal carry. Midoriya, what are you doing? She asked as her usually rosy cheeks flushed with even more color. Getting you out of here, Izuku answered, ignoring if she could walk or not before blasting off wreathed in yellow. The heat curiously did not seem to affect the girl at all, almost blanketing her alongside him. Besides, I'm not dumb enough to fight that thing, he continued, feeling even more of the familiar strain in his chest as well as his muscles. As if responding directly to his comment, the Zero Pointer smacked the top of a building, sending chunks of concrete, metal, and glass directly in their path. Izuku stopped on a dime as the wreckage slammed into the ground rather harmlessly, only serving to separate the two of them from the rest of the applicants. Looks like I don't have a choice in the matter, Izuku sighed with a mixture of frustration and resignation. Stay here and don't put pressure on your ankle, he ordered the girl who stared back at him with wide eyes. You're not seriously going to fight that thing, are you? she shouted. If we leave it unattended, it might harm the others, he responded with urgency. Can you make me weightless? She reluctantly removed his gravity while also curious as to what he'd do with it and then he ignited his kaleidoscopic fire and blasted off toward the head of the robot. This time, she had actually had time to look at and appreciate the unique flames. They were pretty rad in her opinion. She had to remind herself to get his number after the exam ended. Back with Izuku, he was practically over the moon to be simulating unassisted flight with the propulsion of flames, but got a hold of himself and refocused on the task at hand. He weaved through the swipes of the giant robot and projected his flames to full blast on his way toward the head, lighting his right arm with as much green fire as he could manage, consequences be damned. He threw a punch with all of his might and slammed it into the face of the Zero Pointer, blasting it backward and practically off the body of the robot. The rest of the machine soon followed suit, and it tipped over to slam into the ground behind it, luckily only flattening empty buildings. Izuku, meanwhile, was running on the barest of fumes, and he just barely righted himself and slowly began the process of lowering himself to the ground until the last bit of strength left him, and he passed out mid-flight. He was left approaching the ground with his inertia carrying him the rest of the way until Ochako hobbled toward him and guided him back within arm's reach. She cancelled her quirk and tried her best to catch him. But he was heavier than he looked and his dead weight came crashing down on her right as present Mike's voice blared over the city. And that's time, the test is over. The other examinees only barely heard him as they were too focused on the sight they just witnessed. The tall boy was especially floored. The green-haired boy he had wrongly accosted before the exam had gone back into the heart of danger to rescue a fellow examinee from the Zero Pointer. Then he turned around and destroyed the giant robot with what appeared to be shocking ease. He had accused the boy of having nefarious intentions, only for the boy to have the most heroic heart and spirit of everyone there. He had a lot to think about when he returned home. Recovery Girl was rather displeased with Nezu. The brutishness of the exam that encouraged reckless kids to be even more reckless was one thing but she knew the chaotic gremlin had a hand in the destructiveness of this particular zone's zero-pointer. He wanted to make it entertaining for himself and for Midoriya, and it would certainly give poor Inko a heart attack. She just hoped she would make it back in time to see the mama bear throttling the chimera for his stunt. Making her way through the crowd and healing injuries where they were present, she found the man of the hour himself, or, rather, she found him passed out laying across another examinee who was practically dying from her blush. Shaking her head in amusement, the youthful heroine made her way towards the duo. Are you youngsters okay? The old woman asked Ochako, who looked relieved to have literally anything else to focus on. 
I think I twisted my ankle under some debris. He passed out though, you should look at him first, she worriedly fretted over the unconscious boy. Kneeling to examine him, she noted that he was breathing normally but felt even warmer than usual. Ah, don't worry, it's just quirk exhaustion. It happens when he overuses his flames. I can't do much for it, though. Hand me your hand so I can fix up your ankle. The younger girl complied, and recovery girl kissed her on the hand, zapping her of whatever energy she had left while mending her busted ankle. Ochako would have stumbled had she not still been pinned under the unconscious Izuku, so she only laid her head back on the ground and absent-mindedly took the gummies the medic handed her. Meanwhile, a team of medic bots came with a stretcher, and they lifted the boy off of her and onto the stretcher to cart him away. Recovery girl quickly followed behind them. Maybe if she was fast, she could catch the end of the beatdown. You furry little dipshit, what in the nine levels were you thinking? The faculty of Yua were hiding behind the farthest table away from the livid mother, unleashing hell on their principal, and rightfully so. He knowingly endangered her son with a giant robot to test him. Do you have any idea just how badly hurt he could have gotten? Inko broke her throttling of her boss and comrade to allow him to respond. His snout returned to its original white from the blue it had been previously, and he cleared his throat. I wouldn't have orchestrated it if I didn't think he could handle it. But the other examinees could have been caught in the crossfire. Unlikely, as the Zero Pointer was specifically programmed to neglect the other examinees and focus on Midoriya when it spotted him. That doesn't make it any better, in fact, that actually makes it worse. Yagi, against his better judgment, decided to interrupt to take some of the heat away from the principal's admittedly worrying decision. Ah, uh, if I may. No, you may not, Inko silenced him and he quickly returned to his place next to an absolutely quivering power loader. He suspected that she would find out that power loader had been the one to actually program the zero pointer under Nezu's direction any minute now. Izuku awoke to nothing but pain. For a scant few seconds, he assumed he was back training with his mom since waking up in pain was a familiar occurrence afterward. However, the white walls and ceiling he woke up to told him that he wasn't in his room. Ah, you're awake, an old, familiar voice came from beside him. He looked over to see the short frame of recovery girl next to his bed giving him a kind smile. That smile vanished and a stern frown took its place. I should be scolding you for overdoing it again, but I can't fault you entirely since Nezu intentionally put you in position to do so. And from what I saw when I watched the footage back, you did prioritize rescue and tried to avoid fighting until you simply couldn't. Izuku sighed in relief at narrowly avoiding a whack on the head from Recovery Girl's syringe cane. With that said, Recovery Girl continued before lightly whacking him on the head with her cane. He had spoken too soon. You were on the brink of tearing your muscles apart, young man. And she was right, Izuku could definitely feel it. His entire body was sore, and his right arm in particular felt like it went through a meat grinder. He knew that pushing his green flames as far as they could go for that punch was incredibly risky, but he didn't have a lot of options, and he figured that he could reset whatever damage there was with his pink flames. You overused your quirk in that last bid against the Zero Pointer. You're not supposed to fly like that regardless of how little gravity you have. Recovery Girl said while fighting back a chuckle at the thought. And pulling your green fire on your arm could have done severe damage that you wouldn't have been able to immediately heal from. Your body may be immune to overheating, but you were completely drained of stamina, so neither my quirk nor your own pink fire could have done much for you without killing you. Oh, Izuku mumbled in embarrassed realization. Oh is right, she said with a shake of her head, and she reached over and kissed his arm. He felt her quirk at work, zapping some of the energy he had and greatly easing the pain he felt throughout his body. You're not likely to be in a manufactured situation like this again, but there will be times where you will push yourself much further than your limits will safely allow for one reason or another. You did well to do no lasting damage this time around, but please be careful in the future. 
it was your muscles this time, but overdoing your yellow flames could stop your heart or your white flames could give you a brain aneurysm, both of which are exponentially more severe, especially out on the field. Izuku was silent in thought at her words, missing the doctors muttering about reckless damn rodents and Inko would burn this school to the ground if anything happened to her boy. He hadn't considered what would actually happen if he really went overboard with his quirk. The migraines from his white flames were usually enough of a deterrent, but the fight against the Zero Pointer was the first time he truly went beyond plus ultra, and he supposed that there were consequences for that. Since you're awake and in relatively good health, I can let your mother in, Recovery Girl stated, snapping Izuku out of his thoughts. She didn't get the chance to, however, and the door slammed open with his mother rushing into the room and practically diving into his bed to hug him to death. I'm so glad you're okay, she practically cried. I can't believe my son is so cool. Izuku was expecting an emotional reaction along these lines when his mother showed up, but he figured she'd be fretting more over his health and safety than anything else. I honestly thought you'd be a lot more worried. Izuku remarked while returning the hug. I was at first, but Recovery Girl was able to assure me that there was no real, lasting damage. I watched the whole thing. I'm so proud that you were able to pick your battles and focus on the important things before Principal Nezu forced your hand, she explained with a watery smile. I knew he had something to do with that, Izuku lowly muttered. Of course, he did. It's Nezu, she sighed, before something came to her, and a sly smile formed onto her face. You also have a visitor. She's been waiting outside for two hours worried sick about her hero. To be wait a minute, I wasn't it hasn't even been that long. A familiar, high-pitched voice frantically cried out from the hallway. Don't try to be coy, little miss, Inko responded with a grin, and she quickly left the room to retrieve the girl in question revealing a beet red Ochako in her grasp. You've been fretting over him for as long as I have. Your Araka? Izuku asked in confusion. Ah, uh, hi, she barely managed with the amused gazes of Inko and Recovery Girl on her. Not reading the situation, Izuku proceeded on as normal. I'm glad you're okay. Your ankle looked pretty gnarly back there, and I didn't get a chance to check on you again before passing out mid-flight. I should be the one worrying about you, she exclaimed at his concern for her and not himself. You were awesome out there. You lit up into this flaming rainbow and went pow right into the zero pointer and practically blew it up. Everyone is calling you the Rainbow Comet. Rainbow Comet? Izuku asked, quirking an eyebrow in amusement. Can you come up with something better, small mite? Inko asked, sharing her son's mirth. You're never gonna let me live that down, are you? Absolutely not. Ochako watched the two banter in wonder, and then it clicked. Oh, is she your mother that you mentioned earlier? Inko looked at the girl in surprise, and then her eyes returned to her son in a silent question of how much he told her. Yeah, this is her. She works here, Izuku confirmed while meeting his mother's stare to confirm that he didn't tell her any more than that. She nodded and smiled. It's great to meet you, Mrs. Midoriya, Ochako beamed and extended her hand. Likewise, and you can just call me in co, she replied and took the offered hand. Do you live in the area? I'd love to have one of Izuku's friends over for dinner. Ochako was taken completely off guard by the offer, and she quickly put her hands up. I wouldn't want to impose, she wobbly attempted to decline. It's no trouble at all, Inko replied, completely undeterred. It would be nice to have someone else around, and Izuku certainly needs more friends. Recovery girl, knowing exactly what Inko was doing, turned around at her desk to stave off the laughter. Izuku, meanwhile, kept a close, calculating eye on his mother. She was up to something, and the fact that he didn't know what put him on edge. Well, I guess I could, just this once, Ochako bashfully accepted over the rumbling of her stomach. She yelped as Inko snatched her and Izuku's arms and yanked him out of the bed before throwing a quick goodbye to Recovery Girl and leaving with the two teens in her tight grasp. 
Recovery Girl couldn't hold back her laugher any longer. She's just like her mother. I wonder if Toshi has figured it out yet. So, Ochako, do you live in the area? Inko asked while she and the two teens were eating the katsudan she cooked to keep Izuku quiet about his suspicions. H.M.? Oh, sorry, she quickly apologized as she was completely lost in the meal. I'm actually from Mai. My parents rented me an apartment out here so that I could take the entrance exam and not have to ride two hours on the train. Her expression became slightly downcast. I don't know how long I'll have it, though. I don't even know if I'll be accepted into Yua. Stop that. You'll be accepted for sure, Inko chided. I was watching the entire thing. There's no way a team like you two don't make it in. Wait, aren't you grading the exams? Should you even be telling us any of this? Izuku questioned. Who's gonna stop me? She replied with a raised eyebrow. Fair enough, he accepted with a nod. Worst case scenario, she continued, turning back to Ochako. I can just take you on as an apprentice and force them to admit you. What? Both teens choked out. Did I not say that was an option? She asked her son. No, you never mentioned anything of the sort, he answered while trying to regain his bearings. Wait, apprenticeship? How would you be able to do that? Ochako coughed. I'm a retired pro, Inko explained to the girl who now had stars in her eyes. Since I still have my license, I reserve that right. Principal Nezu also owes me quite a few favors. Now, I doubt it'll come to that, though. Izuku took a moment to gather himself completely before refocusing on his mother. I'm surprised you just came right out and said it. You never used to be this comfortable with talking about it in the past. It would have come out at some point, Inko shrugged. Being the underground heroics teacher kind of puts you back into that world whether you like it or not, so there's no use hiding it. Ochako, meanwhile, was positively starstruck. Her new friend was the son of a retired pro who had just offered to take her on as an apprentice if she didn't make it into Yua. Now the two of them were bantering again like she didn't just casually drop a bomb on her entire world. She refused to believe that what was happening was real, but a few pinches to her arm confirmed that it was indeed real life. Um, why? she finally asked, getting the attention of both Midoriyas. Her cheeks immediately flushed at the newfound attention, and she quickly elaborated. Not that I'm not super grateful at the offer, but it's so sudden. Why me, of all people? Stop that. Huh? Stop selling yourself short. Just because you didn't take down as many robots as Izuku or some of the others in the exam doesn't make you any less competent or heroic. Potential is potential, honey, and you have it in spades. I. Your quirk is fascinating, and while not purely offensive, you already know how to use it in creative ways to get the job done. Removing this little gremlin's gravity so that he could fly around like a comic book hero clearly showed that. My quirk isn't purely offensive either, she continued before pulling a fork into her hand from across the table to illustrate her point. But it's about how you use it in tandem with the skills you have. Your quirk already makes you a potentially deadly hand-to-hand -hand fighter. The next step is to improve your hand-to-hand -hand capabilities to properly utilize that potential. Ochako was speechless. No one she had ever met had even once given her any sort of advice like that. Sure, her parents encouraged her to follow her dreams and be the best hero she could possibly be, but they weren't heroes or combatants themselves. They wanted her to succeed, but they couldn't give her any advice like what she had just received. This woman that she met literally earlier that day had revealed herself to be a retired pro and told her precisely what she could do to improve as a hero and fighter. And that was after telling her that she already had potential to be a great hero in the first place to assuage the girl's doubts. What the hell was it about this family that made her want to cry tears of joy and protect them with everything she had? Inko could see the tears building in the girl's eyes, and she knew exactly what to do. Like I said, dear, you'll be just fine. How about I bring out the scrapbook so you and I can look at Izuku's embarrassing baby pictures? Mom. Ochako wiped her eyes and sniffled. 
doing nothing to fight the joyful smile that plastered itself onto her face. I'd love to. She'd hang on to Izuku and Inko for dear life. She'd make damn sure of it. Izuku was sprawled on his couch, TV remote in hand, and channel surfing. Nezu had given him the two weeks between the entrance exam and admittance rejection letters going out off to do as he pleased, and it was primarily spent texting Yui and Ochako. She told him to call her Ochako right after she ate dinner with them the first time. Apparently, Yui had even more luck than him and made a few friends during the exam herself, and he also learned that she had a repertoire of memes rivaling his own collection of hero memorabilia. She also had a notable collection of Super Sentai and Transformers merch in the few pictures of her room that she sent him, and that sparked a discussion about the two franchises in which Izuku learned that Yui was rather passionate about Machas, Kaijus, and Megazords. It instigated an ongoing debate about whether or not All Might could take Godzilla that had dominated the last week and a half for him, so he was taking a break with mind-numbing television. Ami wa mu shindaru. Click. Can we get much higher? Click. Sludge villain has continued to evade capture. Click. Izuku, your letter is here. He heard his mother call from the front door. Shooting up, he looked over the couch to see her hurrying toward him with the letter in hand. She handed it to him, and he felt a hard disk inside the envelope. Taking a moment to stare down at the determining factor of his future, he opened the envelope and pulled out the small disc in front of the formal letter. Confused at what it was, he looked over to his mother to find that she had conveniently left the room. Putting the disc and letter down on the coffee table in front of him, he was taken by surprise when a holographic projection of none other than all might appeared from the disc. I am here, as a projection. Izuku quickly clamped down on his excitement before he could attempt to have a conversation with a pre-recorded video of his idol. Young Midoriya, you received a perfect score on the written exam. That alone would guarantee you admittance to the school in the general studies department. But your story does not end here. In the practical exam, you racked up a total of 57 villain points. Geez, was it really that much? He asked himself. It certainly was. All Might responded with his giant smile, and the video continued before Izuku could question any further. That alone would have gotten you ranked 8th in total points scored. But what kind of hero school would we be if your ability to destroy robots was the only thing we graded on? We were also looking at the content of your character when placed in a situation to help another, even at the cost of yourself. Your many instances of helping and rescuing your fellow examinees especially when you didn't have to, truly displayed that you have the heart of a hero, and as such, you were rewarded 75 rescue points. 75? Izuku incredulously shouted. Yes, 75. That adds up to 132 total points scored. That comfortably puts you in first place. It is my pleasure to say welcome to your hero academia, young Midoriya. The projection faded, and Izuku sat on the couch with only the low sounds of the TV in the background. It was all starting to catch up to him, and a giant smile crept onto his face. I did it, he shouted in pure elation. Language, young man, came the stern response of his mother from the other room, but the effect was muted when she poked her head into the living room bearing a kind, proud smile. Izuku felt like he was walking on air and he immediately went to text his two newest friends to ask them if they got their letters. He saw that they had apparently gotten theirs a little before him, as they both sent him texts declaring that they were accepted and asked him what class he was in. Figuring that the formal acceptance letter had that information, he checked to find out that he was in class 1A. He was happy that Ochako appeared to be with him, but he was a little bummed that Yui was in 1B. Suddenly, one particular detail occurred to him. During the projection, a list of the rankings from the entrance exam appeared on screen. Turning on the device and fast-forwarding to the end, he stopped the recording on the results. He was in first with his 57 villain points and 75 rescue points, and he noticed that Ochako was in fourth with 28 villain points and 45 rescue points, 
likely from her helping him take down the zero pointer and then catching him afterward. But a single name stood out to him. Katsuki Bakugo, second place with 77 villain points and zero rescue points. Bakugo was there, Izuku quietly said to himself. And if he was being honest with himself, of course Bakugo was. It was his dream to be the best hero ever and become even better than All Might. And there was no better way to accomplish that than by attending the best hero school in the nation and All Might's own alma mater. It came as no surprise to the green-haired boy that Bakugo trained exceptionally hard for it, as his score of 77 villain points made clear. But that brought a specific event back to his memory. Out of my way, extra. There was something familiar about that voice and hair to Izuku at the time, but meeting Ochako pushed it from his mind. Now, with nothing distracting him, it became all too clear to him. Holy shit, that was Bakugo he said to himself, subconsciously making sure to keep his voice low to prevent his mother from hearing him. Did he not recognize me? Did I not recognize him? Then, another thought occurred to him that could make his time at Yua complicated. I hope he isn't still upset about what happened all those years ago. Looking back at the ranking, he winced. He'll definitely be upset about getting second place, especially to me. Katsuki Bakugo was having a good day. He had dominated the entrance exam two weeks prior like he knew he would, and all that was left was to wait for his inevitable acceptance. Passing the time at his shitty school with useless extras was tedious, however, especially with the annoying pink-skinned girl with horns that was always on his case about being mean to people and kept trying to be his friend. He didn't need friends. He was a winner, he would be the best damn hero ever. So, when the letter from Yua finally came in the mail, he knew it was simply a formality. He destroyed the most robots in his zone, and the written test was a piece of cake. The envelope contained a disc and a formal letter, so he pressed play on the disc, and a holographic projection of All Might appeared. Now, he was stoked. All Might himself was telling him how well he did. It was clearly the first step on his path to surpassing All Might, and no one would stop him. That is why it is my pleasure to inform you that you scored 77 villain points. Hell yeah, 77 points. That earned you second place in the total rankings. Bakugo's brain stalled at that declaration. He didn't hear a word of All Might welcoming him to Yue and the projection finally shutting off. His mind was stuck on the simple almost alien detail of him getting second place. He grabbed the disc and rewound it, if for no other reason than to ensure he hadn't misheard. Surely, he did not annihilate the competition with gusto just to come in second, right? Sure enough, that was exactly what had happened, and the display of the rankings only confirmed it. The first thing he noticed was the zero tied to his name under rescue points, which confused him. The hell were rescue points, he was the only one who didn't have them, but he still scored better than almost everyone else, so they clearly didn't matter. Then, the real issue presented itself. Who had the gall to take first place away from him? Izuku Midoriya. Bakugo's brain stalled for a second time. Deku. The nerd had shown off his quirk and then dropped off the face of the earth. He still remembered that day, the look in the nerd's eyes when he looked down on him with contempt surrounded by flames of all colors. Then, he was just gone. He never showed up to school again, and Bakugo hadn't seen him once in five years. In that time, the old hag pulled him out of his school and transferred him to one on the other side of the city with the excuse that their principal was a pedo, but he was dubious about that. The news that came out a short time later and continued over the years about entire school districts being dismantled for promoting quirk discrimination and terroristic ideologies only confirmed his suspicions that something bigger was going on. That news, however, recontextualized his last meeting with Deku. That day, he was so angry that the nerd had hidden his quirk from him and pretended to be weak just to laugh at him behind his back and he let that useless teacher get into his head and fanned his anger, pointing him towards Deku to remind him of his place. However, with the knowledge that the principal was arrested and that teacher went on the run, 
as well as his own mother screaming at him about what he did to the nerd, it forced him to sit down and reevaluate exactly what was going on at that school. Deku was quirkless, or, at least, he thought he was up until they were ten. Everyone else thought he was, too, so they treated him as such. Even the adults treated him differently, but that might have been due in part to Deku being freakishly smart since that made the adults uncomfortable. A few even walked on eggshells around him as if they had something to hide, but the students mostly just made him a pariah for being the weird kid without a quirk. Was that, was that by design? Did the adults and teachers try to set Deku up? They never said or did anything when anyone messed with him, and Deku never really seemed to care much about it, which pissed people off even more and compelled them to mess with him even harder. Was the whole school in on trying to wipe the quirkless off the map? Was that useless teacher riling him up that day for that sole purpose? Was that teacher using him to hurt Deku? Bakugo snarled, small explosions crackling in his palms as he seethed at the thought. Those teachers were using him and kissing up to him for their bullshit quirk supremacy. They used him to attack a kid for not having a quirk just to further their own warped agendas. Those, he seethed, no one uses me as their patsy. Bakugo was certain that if the school hadn't already been knocked down with a wrecking ball driven by a talking rat, he'd march down there himself and blow them all to kingdom come. He didn't need the help of any stupid terrorists, damn it. He'd be the best without them trying to kiss his ass and give him shortcuts. And Deku. Deku wasn't safe, either. The nerd had a quirk, and it was powerful. Wherever the hell he was during the last five years, he had obviously been training and getting stronger. The first place result in the rankings proved that, and it meant that, for the moment, Deku was better than him. That would not stand. He hoped that Deku was strong. He hoped that Deku was really strong. He wanted Deku to be at his best when Katsuki Bakugo finally reminded him and everyone else just who the hell he was. He would be the best, and no quirk terrorists or even Deku himself would stand in the way of that. You hear me, you Deku? I'm coming for you, and I'm gonna be the god I'm best. What the hell are you screaming up there for, ya brat? The voice of his mother came from downstairs. None of your business, you over the hill hag. Who the hell are you calling over the hill, you shitty brat? I'll have you know that your father still loves this as... Mitsuki, please. Thank you for joining us on this incredible journey through What If Deku's Quirk Gained the Power of Godzilla? I hope you found it as intriguing and thought-provoking as we did. A big shout out to Drit Bayless for crafting such a compelling story. Don't forget to check out their profile on FanfictionNet for more amazing works the link is in the description below. If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and don't forget to subscribe to What If Deku 2 for more fascinating explorations into the world of fanfiction and fantasy. Your support helps us create more content like this and we're always excited to hear your thoughts and suggestions in the comments section. See you guys in the next video.